Yeah. Yeah, maybe? Alright, cool. We are live. Evening, everyone. Welcome back to the stream. Hey, Kylie. Good to hear from you. How are things? Things are going well on everyone else's end. Uh, I am ready to get back right into uh, Dragon Age 2. Uh, in case you missed the end of the stream last uh, last time on Monday, uh, we did finish Near Automata. So if you want to see the ending or endings, which I really, really just love, uh, I, I gotta say I love the uh, the ending and even the the end credit stuff. Wonderful. Um, if you missed it, go back check it out. Um, hi, private investigator. Good to hear from you. Doing well, thank you. Doing very well. Uh, we did finish Nier on Monday, so we are all done. Um, game is in the bag. We are uh, we're moving on at this point. I was saying uh, near the end of the stream, uh, before we got all the way to the end, um, I was saying how I would maybe go back at some point and do some side quests I haven't done, get some of those alternate endings and things. But as it turns out, that's something of an impossibility with that game. So uh, if you want to know why, go check that out. Uh, um, I don't want to... If you're not familiar with it, then uh, I don't want to spoil it. I talked about it a good deal there. So it was uh, it was very enjoyable. I really did like it. Um, but that does mean that Monday, uh, our next stream, we're going to be moving on to uh, Far Cry 5. Let's just... Uh, yeah, we have something to do here with Wayward Sun. That's the, um, uh, the, uh, Viscount Sun. Let's see. We already got him back, but I think we still need to, uh, go back and, and uh, look over where he was for some things. Oh, hi! I don't want you here. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. P.I. asks, uh, random question, but what did you guys have for dinner? Uh, good question for everybody else. I, uh, we made, uh, a, um, uh, a Shire pudding. So basically a, a Lord of the Rings recipe version of Yorkshire pudding. Um, I'll put a, uh, I'll put a recipe to it somewhere in the description and maybe in the food channel, um, on the Discord. After the stream. Of course. Um, but yeah, I'll look into that. Um, uh, Eric, unless if you're uh, if you're if you're listening and you want to throw that in the food in the food channel, feel free to. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it was it was very, very good. And we put it uh, we made it in the uh, the instant pot combination all in one thingy. Um, so it was uh, basically just using the uh, Using the the, the uh, I'll call it an oven, I guess, setting for the thing. Very good. Very very good. Hey, we leveled. Yeah, Eric says we should have taken a picture. That's okay. We'll do more. We'll make it again. Maybe we'll make another one after stream. Hey, maybe. Uh, if you want to do it literally right now, you totally can. I won't stop you. If you want to eat the whole damn thing right now while I'm on stream, I, technically, if you want, you can. Uh, that is true, though. Er Erica is, is, has a point. She's eating a frozen dinner, and that is uh, that is in part because this was not a particularly uh, large thing for dinner, uh, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to shrink myself down just a tiny bit. Um, so it was it was good. But I'm glad that I have a, a filling drink here. I've got a matcha shake, which will do the job for filling me up, I suppose. Eric says she's too lazy. I understand. I understand completely. You haven't had a mushroom and Swiss burger, potato wedges, sliced garden tomatoes. Sounds good. Ooh, a spindleweed. Uh, P.I. says, my wife made some shepherd's pie with mashed potatoes. Pretty good. That does sound very good. 
That sounds very, very good. Love Shepherd's Pie. Um, Shepherd's Pie proper with lamb or uh, or cottage pie with uh, beef? Or how did you do? Um, I've done... Uh, last thing I did... Um, that's a great recipe for a cottage pie, which is with uh, with beef. Um, with a uh, nice... Um, mashed potatoes over the top as a crust. Nice and toasted over the top. Very good. Totally setting people on fire here. You, though, are a problem. Cool. Uh, Kylie made a stir fry with yellow squash, beef, broccoli, cauliflower, hoisin sauce, and garlic sauce. That does sound really good. I would, of course, uh, omit the cauliflower. Not a big fan of that sort of thing, but everything else does sound sound delightful. And I guess I could see cauliflower working in there. I guess. Uh, Erica says I used to make a uh, chicken casserole. Cut up Tyson chicken nuggets, can of corn, can of peas, can of mushroom soup, little hot water, ton of mashed potatoes, and seasonings. It was very very good especially for how simple that was uh, bake and then mix in a ton of cheese it was really good um, pirate investigators why he's lamb awesome awesome i had a uh, like um, like you probably saw in the food discord uh the food channel we had uh, a lamb curry over the weekend it was wonderful not likely mm. fine varick <sighs> eric says and sprinkle over uh uh, I grew up poor and know how to how to be uh, um, how to be a meal. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kylie says lamb is my favorite meat besides goat. I hardly ever get goat. Probably investigator says lamb and pork. That's my favorite. Yeah, probably lamb for me. Um, then I I don't know. I, I like beef. I'm what can I say? I'm I'm rather American that way. Can I burst or no? Nah, I'm gonna go up the the fire nice thing. Bigger fireball. Yeah, let's go bigger fireball. Meryl. Hmm. Level 11 yet. We can do some of this stuff. Tempest is nice. Petrify. Kindly says, uh, y'all, I'm so excited about my, uh, about my baby cousin. Uh, and then Kevin says, yes, the sweet baby cousin. Lovely. Indeed. Uh, she's adorable little bean. Mm. Also good coffee. Very good coffee. I forget what, um, uh, anyway, let's do, let's do Petrify, why not, Andy. Private Investigator says, did you see the, uh, paragraphs about the uniforms of the Praetorian Guards in the Discord? Yes, I did. Um, I know, like I said, I know, I know some of it. I, material history isn't, um, I, well... I would say that um, a lot of what I uh, a lot of what I studied in the late Roman, the late Roman period was um, uh, was political, right? So uh, political and literary, right? Because a lot of it tied in with um, tied in with my uh, philosophical studies and such. Um, so I didn't get into too much of the material culture aspect, which I I, I kind of regret because uh, that is first of all some of the most interesting. Um, archaeological evidence we have uh particularly of the uh, of the roman period of the classical period more broadly and uh 
uh, and also I missed a hell of an opportunity because one of my uh, one of my uh, my professors as an undergrad was uh, I've mentioned this before. Um, uh, she specializes in uh, in uh, classical, but particularly Roman and particularly late Roman, so Severan period for the most part coinage. Uh, and looking at all of the symbolism in coins and all of that that can tell us about the political st uh, political state, uh, about cultural practices, about trade, and all kinds of really, really cool stuff. Um, she's done a whole massive, massive database of, uh, of Roman coinage that I think is scholarly, scholarly accessible. Um, I think you can access uh, very f finely detailed images for, for research. Ellie says, oh yeah, pork is my go-to. Since goat's not really on the market too often. In Publix, lol. Yeah, that's true, same. Unfortunately, same. Uh, and yes, uh, she's so sweet and adorable and beautiful, and I can't wait to meet her. She, absolutely. I, I, I am always so happy to, to see people having kids and adorable babies and stuff. Private Investigator says, I can make a killer pork tenderloin. I don't know. It's probably my least favorite. Might be my least favorite cut of pork. I'm not a big fan of pork chops, that sort of thing, but... Um, tenderloin I usually don't go for it unless... Uh, unless it is absolutely, absolutely deeply marinated in sauce. In which case that can be okay, but... Be very leveled. Yeah, uh, I like pork sometimes. Like I like pork sausages. I like ribs. I like bacon. I like pork belly. Um, I like pulled pork. So like you know, hams and butts and things. But uh, but the the very white meat of pork, the like sweet white meat, I can't really I can't really get behind it just quite as well. Um. Uh, P.I. says, uh, since I'm a week on leave um, because of a bit of a fever, uh, I'm going to do some more research on the history of the Praetorian Guard. Cool. Very cool. Take one more step and the boy dies. Tell this dirtbag who we are. If I were you, I wouldn't be threatening the Viscount's son. What? Oh, I suppose you just got a tip from a slaver that he was selling mage flesh cheap. You never thought to ask where he got it? You never wondered if you were buying the Viscount's well-known love child from his elven mistress. The boy he swore to protect, even if it meant raising the entire free marches? I seek no war with the free marches. Take the lad to his father. Oh, damn it, Varric! <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> I was confused for a moment because I actually thought we were here for the Viscount son. We're totally not. We're here to, so to remind everybody, we're here to pick up the elf's, uh, the elf woman's son, the elf woman from the alienage, whose son is a mage, uh, but had fled the chantry, and now he's getting uh, sort of oppressed by demons. So that's its own problem. But man, Varric, that was that was brilliant. Oh, that's quite a generous offer. Brilliant bit of storytelling. This was the price set on the boy. Please accept it as an offer of peace. So we got the money too. Oh, Who are you, Varric? Are you working for the Templars? Your mother sent me. Huh. Hardly a difference. I can't believe her. My whole life, it was all. I'll love you and protect you. Then I have some bad dreams and it's off to the Templars. Hmm. I'm here to help you, Fainriel. Why? You don't even know me. I am you. You know, you're the first mage I've met. Most are locked up like lepers. Would... Is there any chance you'd help me reach the Dalish? That's where I was trying to go. See if they'd take me in. I'm as much Dalish as human.
I want to make fun of his ears. It seems a little rude. He has very human ears. Um, P.I. says, I was debating an, a, a bit with an atheist. What do you think is the best point uh, to kind of shut down an atheist argument, uh, if you know what I mean? Well, I, it depends on the argument, right? It really depends on the argument. Um, if you're talking strictly about sort of arguments for God's existence, um, purely from a rational perspective, uh, I kind of have to stick to Anselm's, the ontological argument. Um, Kevin says, dangle them over a high precipice and see if they begin to pray. Um, let's just call that Pascal's wager, um, and move on. <laughs> um, the, the pragmatist argument, I guess. Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, something along those lines. Um, I do have videos on both of those, by the way, on, on Anselm's ontological argument and Pascal's wager. Um, I actually have two on Pascal. Um, let me see. I'll put them in the description in case you haven't found them. Um, Pascal, Anselm. Uh, in any case, I do I do think that, th though, maybe more rhetorically, right? Um, more rhetorically, I have found, and this is going to maybe just sort of betray my, my philosophical educated elitism. Um, but I kind of tend to think that the, the, the most, the most effective arguments for planting a seed, which is what you really want to do, right? Cause you're not going to change somebody's mind just like that, but the most effective arguments that can plant a seed are those that are, that, that cannot be fully understood immediately. Not because they're dumb, right? Not because they're they're over they're intentionally complex, but because they have so much background to them, right? That it starts to get them to start questioning deeper things, right? That they already assume by default, right? And and for this sort of thing, you can go with the ontological argument. You can go with any of Aquinas's arguments, or or even just you know put the five of them out there, right? But anything like this, kind of the key to it is to is to try and get them to start questioning uh, their really basic assumptions about how the world works. Right? Basic metaphysical uh, and sometimes even ethical assumptions. If you can get them to start doing that and start to look look a little bit deeper into the way the world is, um, then often they'll start to see that, hey, wait a minute, this, this, over, this overarching metaphysical picture that I've just kind of imbibed with the culture, it, it doesn't hold together. Right, doesn't hold together as well as I thought. Um, so if you can get them to start thinking about the transcendentals, so goodness itself, things like this, what it is for something to exist, what it is for something to be good, right? start getting them to think about these things objectively. Um, that will lead them towards the basic groundwork upon which you can build a proper theological argument. Um, that, or um, whether uh, transcendentals, also getting them to start thinking about um, about uh, creatures in in natural law terms, in terms of teleology and directedness, right? Which is something that again the the modern world has has is no time for and no framework for, unfortunately, right? uh, philosophically and culturally, especially culturally speaking. Right? Um, I actually have a whole playlist uh, called uh, Preamble of Fide, uh, the preambles of faith. Um, which is a good place to look uh, for a sort of structure. Um, uh, a good place to look for a sort of structure on how to how to sort of build up towards uh, a theological argument, a theistic argument. Because uh, again, I don't think you can just go right off the bat and say, "Well, uh, well, Aquinas teaches that that um, we observe motion in the world." Uh, then, etc. Therefore, God. Yes, I mean the argument's perfectly sound. Um, all of Aquinas's uh, five ways are perfectly sound. The problem is, or maybe the benefit is, depending on how you look at it, that in order to even see why the premises of the arguments might be true, you need to have a very, very um, richly textured uh, scholastic pre-modern metaphysics. Okay. And there's a lot there's a reason that a lot of modern philosophers will just sort of dismiss um, the Thomistic arguments out of hand. 
It's because they don't have uh, they don't have a place for it in their metaphysical picture of the world. So I think that that is really the place to start, and that's usually where I wind up do where I do wind up starting if I'm if I'm teaching uh, for a philosophy of religion class, like, which I'm starting in like three weeks. Um, uh, I'm doing that again this semester, so I'm teaching two of them. I gotta check; it's two or three. I'm teaching two ones. I'm I'm teaching three one of the two semesters. I don't remember if it was this one or next one, but either way, I'm teaching philosophy of religion again. And what I always have to wind up doing is starting off with with objectivity, then start, move on from there to logic, and then move on from there to a basic, basic, basic picture of the world um, that's very alien to the modern mind, but again, makes a whole lot more sense. Um, so that's, that's where I would point you. As again, the big thing to keep in mind is if you don't convince somebody right away, especially on the internet, you have not lost anything except maybe a little bit of time, but you know what? That's that's fine. Uh, you're doing something worthwhile. Um, and hey, you're probably having fun doing it. Oh, uh, <laughs> good question-ish. Uh, P.I. asked why I quit making videos. I didn't really, I just have a really, really slow production schedule because it's, it's, it's a side thing, really. Um, this is not what I do primarily. Primarily, I actually teach. Um, I, I actually teach classes. Um, so really, my video production schedule is is priority one is when I need a lecture for class. Priority two is when I want to make one and get around to it. Priority three is if someone directly pays me for doing one, which is yet to happen. <laughs> so that's kind of my uh, that's kind of my my uh, thing. Yes. Also, as 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 my wonderful wife Erica has said. Uh, he didn't quit. I didn't quit. I'm just lazy. I don't know if I would say lazy, but fine. I'll accept it. Um, my Loki video is, quote, coming eventually. That is, that is correct. Um, um, I want to, uh, I would like to start working on that soonish. Yes, also, once classes hit, I will be making more, because again, uh, my main goal for, for videos, my main purpose for all of this is... I use these for class, right? Most of my videos I actually used for uh, for teaching class. I see you're just dying at that comment. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, it's mostly true. Mostly true. It's fair enough. You'd be alone among the Dalish, even more than a Dalish would be here. Compared to being held prisoner or made tranquil, I'll risk being lonely. Look, I know point it's with different that. in other kingdoms, but here. No one helps circle mages. Anything the Templars don't like, you get the brand. The Dalish. They've had magic forever. They could teach me. I won't be a danger, I swear. It would be your humanity that marks you among the people, not your magic. But I think they will take you. If there was another mm. way, the circle would know it. You deserve a chance at freedom. Thank you. I did not. In my wildest dreams, I could not have foreseen this. Thank the creators, you were the one my mother hired to find me. I will forever be in your debt, friend. Whatever their differences, his mother deserves to know he's alive. Yeah, um, Aveline didn't like that so much. But what are you going to do? Cunning, maybe he'll open a lock once. I love that he is a bard. He's basically just a bard. Varric is, I mean. Here's a fun, interesting thought. What D&D class would Varric be? I mean, I knew he'd be a bard, but what would his subclass, what would his, his uh, bardic college be? Eloquence, maybe. If anyone's super familiar with the bard classes. Uh, that's an interesting thing to speculate. I, I I would I would lean a little towards eloquence, maybe valor, maybe. Kevin says I have noticed that the key to uh, convincing anyone of anything is to be their friend. Uh, make your argument an amicable, light-hearted conversation. Consistently live your beliefs. That too. 
Um, I will say absolutely. Um, one of the biggest hangups for a lot of modern atheists is the idea that that Christians and theists in general are th are the the other in some way or another. They're the other, right? Um, specifically, they could be the other in part because they think that that it's that uh, that the Christians are uh, are dumb. Right? That's really, really that's an incredibly common belief, right? Uh, very, very commonly, people think that um, that atheists in particular think that that Christians, like smart people, can't believe in God, can they? Like, why would you believe in God if you're intelligent? Obviously, the brights, as some of them call themselves, um, have seen through all of that nonsense. But part of one of the best sort of apologetic tactics is to show that um, a, an intelligent person can, in fact, uh, be, uh, can, in fact, be um, a, a Christian, narrowly, or more broadly, can believe in God. Uh, and that is, you know, that's a um, kind of a hard thing for, for a lot of people to, to, to figure their way through, you know. Uh, again, we, we typically don't have the... We don't have that as a kind of uh, a default um, a default sort of assumption uh, in our culture today. By default, we, we even, even a lot of believers, even a lot of theists, by default assume that, you know, uh, you know, higher education and whatnot um, are more likely to make one, uh, to get one to uh, be more uh, inclined to atheism. And I don't think that's, that's, I mean, empirically, it's not correct. And empirically, again, the, the, um, empirically, uh, theists tend to be on either end of the bell curve of intelligence. The, 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 the particularly, the particularly intelligent and the particularly unintelligent, um, tend to be more theistic, I think, if I recall. Uh, whereas atheists tend to be, to you, uh, not to be overly derogatory, but midwits. The sort of 100 to 120 IQ. You know, people who are above average, smart enough to start thinking about it. But then they kind of stop, often. Right? And so a lot of what you get, a lot of, a lot of uh, one of the major ways of, of sort of evangelizing is to to show that you can be a rational, well-thinking, and well-adjusted, and kind, and good theist and Christian. Which is contrary to the assumption of a lot of, a lot of atheists, especially militant atheists. And, and seeing that starts to present cracks in the armor, you know? And that's part of what you're going for. Evan says, if, you, uh, if people see that your way of life is both rational and practically applicable, they'll consider it with uh, much more seriousness. Also, also, on that note, if you're living a good life, morally, ethically, and just psychologically and socially, if you seem like you're having a good time of it, to, for lack of a... I mean, to simplify, I suppose. If you seem like you're doing quite well for yourself with all of these beliefs and these practices, people are going to take it seriously a little bit. A, a little bit more than they otherwise would. And that's good. Um... Kevin says, the worst mistakes I ever made in debate uh, with heathens is to be heavy-handed and purely rational. People aren't purely rational. I mean, maybe we should be, but we're definitely not. Maybe we should be more, maybe, okay, maybe not purely. Maybe we should often be more rational than we are, especially with respect to propositional belief claims. But we're really not, right? So, and that's fine, right? We have to acknowledge that. And it's hard for, uh, I mean... Academics, philosophers, autistic people, call it what you want. People like us. <laughs> um, uh, P.I. says, uh, what do you think would have happened uh, if Mark Antony somehow survived and stopped Gaius Octavius uh, Thrunus? 
I never hear I never hear his surname or his his last name I suppose. Uh, I just usually hear either Gaius or Octavius or Caesar Augustus uh, from taking the throne. Um, it probably would have it in the short term at least. Long term is much harder to predict, but in the short term at least, it probably would have been an end to the uh, the imperatorship, the the empire per se. Um, and and Caesar would have been a one and done seen as a tyrant, or Julius Caesar would have, would have been a one and done seen as a tyrant, um, probably. And then it would have it would have sort of regressed into something more like the late Republic, with something more like consulships, uh, or perhaps uh, perhaps the sort of strongman tyrants or triumvirates or whatnot, um, still with some power uh, in the Senate. It probably would have would have just sort of prolonged the sort of late Republic period, is my guess. I, I can't see Mark Antony or Cleopatra, mostly just due to her, her regionalism. I couldn't see either of them realistically taking anything like the Imperial throne. Heaven says faith is cerebral, but it's also relational. Humans are composites of thought, feeling, and base needs and desires. Belly, the heart, and the head. It's all there, right? Um, and that this is this goes back to Plato, this goes to C.S. Lewis. Um, I have a, a decent lecture, uh, this is a, an actual in the classroom lecture on, uh, on the abolition of man. Um, the first chapter of his book, The Abolition of Man, is called The Men Without Chests. And it's specifically about this, right? We have base desires, needs and desires, that sort of thing. The body, the very bodily part of us, uh, the animal part of us, which is absolutely necessary and important to who and what we are. Then we also have passion, the domain of the heart, right? This can be also good or bad. But again, it, it, it's bad when it's out of line with who we are as a whole and out of line with the guidance of reason. It's also out of line when it's too strong or too weak, right? And either of those is a, a common problem, especially among, you know, intellectuals. Uh, the intelligentsia seem, tend to be uh, relatively uh, dispassionate uh, in a negative sense. Right? Uh, the way of, uh, of of not being able to get ourselves up into a proper lather over things that we really ought to be concerned about, uh, and I say this in the in the sort of plural first person because I have this problem from time to time. This is not a this is not an abstraction. This is this is something that I observe in myself and in you know friends and colleagues. Uh, it's something that Lewis observes uh, when he wrote uh, Men Without Chess. So again, the, all of this. This, of course, goes back to Plato as well, where I have uh, I've also spoken somewhat about that elsewhere. If you're wanting me to go into more of it, I can. But... Your son has taken refuge with the Dalish. What? <clears throat> he is human. They did not even wish me to raise him among them. But they do value magic more than the men of Kirkwall. Perhaps he can have both safety and freedom. As I said, I have little... And he'll be the new keeper. But this is a Dalish ring That'd be that has been in my family for generations. Please accept it with my thanks. Hooray! It's good, I suppose. Rune Silverite Ring. Huh. No. Uh, let's swing by Meryl's house and see how that is. See what that's like. Oh, that's right, she has an alluvian in here. I didn't think you'd come. I'll find something relatively clean for you to sit on. Hmm. <laughs> Can I get you something to eat or drink? I have water. 
I came here to see you, Meryl. You don't have to fuss over me. You're so kind. My first guest and I'm already a terrible host. I wanted to thank you for bringing me here, but I'm making a mess of it. You're so sweet, Meryl. I'm not really. If good wishes were enough, everyone in Thedas would be happy. I haven't exactly had many friends. Not even among my own clan. This is... tricky. What made you unpopular with the Dalish? Being first to the Keeper, I was always a bit secluded. I studied magic and history while the others were learning the Via Tanadal. It's good that I left. I'd have made a terrible Keeper. I was never that good with people. You seem to be getting the hang of it already. I'm glad you think so. Thank you for coming to visit me, Hawk. It means a lot to me. Aww. See, this, is, this place isn't that bad. It's not so bad. Not, not great, but... There's spikes in the windows, but, you know, we that can be forgiven. That's cool. Nice. Where is that? What is that? Looks like Haven almost. Uh, that weird cult town up in the mountains in the first game. And in the third game. Not in this one. This city is amazing. Do you know I saw someone get mugged? Right outside. It was fascinating. <laughs> Everything happens here all at once. How does anyone keep it all straight? Someone is jumped outside your door, and that's exciting. It must be the Alien Age greeting. Hasn't happened to me yet, though. They must not like me. Excuse me? It's so busy here. So many things just get oh lost. Oh, God. Tevin <sighs> says, imagine offering clean water uh, in that sort of setting would actually be quite the treat. So really good manners. That is true. That is a fair point. Um, I do get the impression that, I mean, um, Dragon Age is a fairly low fantasy setting, uh, despite it being, you know, relatively magical, um, that doesn't mean that, you know, day-to-day -day people have, you know, nice sanitation and whatnot. So that, yeah, fair point, fair point. The Templars haven't found you, have they? I've been careful, even among the Dalish. Keepers never work magic in public. And I think the Templars don't even see me. I'm just another elf in the alienage. Do you miss the Dalish? I miss her and Pival stories. The creaking of Aravels in the breeze. The city is so busy and confusing. And the elves here are not like my clan. But I'll get used to Kirkwall in time. Think of it like a game. You can pick up all the things people drop and overlook. Maybe count them. <laughs> I think they mostly drop garbage. I'm glad you came by. I needed someone to talk to. Aww. An investigator asks, why is it censoring his text when he's saying nothing wrong? Um, well, you might think you're saying nothing wrong, but Susan says differently, apparently. I apologize. I have no idea. Um, I promise I'm not doing it. We, we the channel, aren't doing it. I am uh, terribly sorry to hear that, though. It could be that it's catching something like um, it's on the desk. something like a like it's filtering a word that it thinks is similar to another word that people use it to get around sensors. That that becomes a problem in a lot of cases. Like Erica, tell the story about all of the wild asterisks in 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 various fan fiction type stuff from back in the old days of. Like, 2006, or whenever. Whenever it was we were in high school. 
proud scion of the Hawk family. I dare not contact you directly, but we have met before, and I know you to be a person of good character and unusual ability. Indulge me in a meeting outside the city, for I require your aid in a delicate task. As a token of good faith, I have enclosed a modest sum. There will be more waiting if you can help. Please come as soon as you receive this. If you do not, the lives of many innocents may be on my hands. Oh, okay, so this is a little bit... Ooh. This is a little more serious than I was making it with the voice. I apologize for the voice. <laughs> my bad. Um, Eric says, oh no. Uh, oh no, it was the online version of those mouse books. Oh! Redwall. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah, the online version of Redwall, because of the whatever site it was on, um... It had, like, asterisks and things in the place of letters in all sorts of what one would think are perfectly ordinary words. Um, but they were words that were part of other words that could be interpreted as bad words. So it was absolutely... Uh, it, was, it was borderline unreadable in certain cases, apparently. Uh, yes, Kevin, I, uh, I I heartily stand by this. We are all very open to free expression. Absolutely right. You owe us, Isabella. Well, Lucky, I'll tell you what. Since the information you gave me was worth nothing... That's what I'll pay you. Me and my boys will get our money's worth, bitch. Oh, you poor sweet thing. I think the striking sounds are a little off for some Tell reason. Me lucky. Is this worth dying for? <laughs> I didn't think so. Maybe it's the Spanish guitar, but I just but I just watched Zorro last night, the Mask of Zorro. Which totally holds up, by the way. Watch it, if you haven't in a while. Very good. But this is giving this is kind of reminding me. In my room upstairs. What do you say? Not if you heard about that deep bones expedition. I once fell asleep in that corner. Alright, well, let's see what Isabella is up to over here. My. And here I thought the only men in this place were besotted fools who couldn't hoist the mainsail. I'll take that literally. Kevin says, Vince, for example, freely expresses his disappointment at, at my uh, sense of humor. Yeah, sometimes, when it's bad. <laughs> oh! Huh. I wonder if... Okay, so... I'm, I'm not going to risk saying it, I suppose, but I've, I've said Discord out loud on the stream plenty of times, so apparently if that's what's being censored, maybe it's because, like, because I know YouTube has, especially in live stream comments, in live stream, like, the, the, this thing, the thing, the thing that's right there, that thing, um, not comments, the, the chat, that's it, live chat, Jesus, what's wrong with me? Um, I know that uh, there are that YouTube has pretty tight restrictions on things like links to external sites, um, and I think that's mostly just to retain viewership. It's a businessy thing, um, so that might be that might be why. Uh, that might be what's doing it. I mean, you can just say channel, and we'll we'll link blank channel, and we'll probably know what you mean. So. Oh yeah, and Eric said it earlier. Oh yeah, you did, didn't you? No idea. It doesn't like you. I like you, though. So, subvert the Star Wars quote, unfortunately. Um, oh, well, I guess if... <laughs> I guess I didn't draw enough attention to the to that, that phrase already. Hawk has to. 
When you talk about hoisting the mainsail, what do you really mean? It's a really awkward way of asking. What else could it mean? It requires strength, knowledge of rigging, and a small measure of sobriety. I know my way around rigging just fine. And I'm good with my hands. Excuse oh me? Oh my. I'm Isabella. Previously Captain Isabella. Sadly, without my ship, the title rings a bit hollow. You're Ferelden, aren't you? You have that look about you. I was in Denerim not too long ago. You know, you might be just what I'm looking for to solve a little problem I have. She was in the first game, I'll remind you. Uh, she's the one who uh, who teaches you to be a um, duelist, or can teach you to be a duelist. Can't anyone fix their own lives around here? Must be something in the water. Someone from my past has been oh, pestering yeah. me. I've arranged for a duel. If I win, he leaves me alone. But I don't trust him to play fair. I need someone to watch my back. Darn it. I just realized. Give me one moment. I can do this. Do 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 do, do. image. Do 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 do. Uh, image. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. This is taking a little bit, but this is very important. There it is. There we go. It's poorly placed. Here we go. And I'll put it right by there. I'm bigging it just a bit. There. Anyway. It can go away now. That was that. Anyway, moving on. Um I had what I had one made specifically for Isabella. And I didn't have it up. So what's going on here? Why can't you guys see? There it is. Anyway. Bonk stick for Hawk. And for Isabella. Who's this person you've arranged to meet? His name is Hader. We worked together back in Antiva. He's never liked me. He's been asking about me all around Kirkwall. Thought I'd get it over with and meet him face to face. Why a duel? <laughs> I like duels. It's what I do. And if I win, he'll be dead. Problem solved. Well, okay then. You wanted information from Lucky. What was it? I asked Lucky and his boys to track down something I lost. They failed to do it. It's nothing to worry about, and this is much more important. What makes you think I'm right for this? You saw me talking to Lucky, didn't you? Those boys couldn't manage simple information gathering. I can't trust the riffraff in this place to do anything right. But you, you're different. Sure. I think I could manage watching your back. New friend. <laughs> I'll bet. I've arranged to meet Hader in Hightown after dark. I'll meet you there. Jesus. Why is she like this? Why is he like this when he's, when he's around her? It must be the no pants. So, I've been dying to know. What was going through your head when you fought that ogre? I knew that whatever happened, I had to get the others to safety. Well, lots of people talk about nobility and selflessness, generally in the same stories that have magic beans. <laughs> Somehow, Hawk, I imagine things won't be dull with you around. Not that I expect the deep roads to be boring, mind you. Constant threat of doom does tend to keep you awake. Yeah, I like I like Hawk being at least a little bit noble, especially with respect to his family. That is, after all, as the meme goes, I came here to uh, 
came here to protect my family and kick ass, and I'm all out of family. Or not yet, but I'm getting there. Uh oh. Drop something on my keyboard. Hold on. Um. But yeah, I uh, I I know there is a mod to make Isabella wear pants, and I'm kind of thinking about it. Kind of thinking about getting it. The swords are unique, Kevin says. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I I like the sword design in in Dragon Age, just generally in the Dragon Age universe, primarily because it is unique and it's a style. It's it's unique stylistically, not pointlessly. Right? None of them are well. Okay, that's not true. Uh, some of them are cartoonishly impractical, like the big, really, really broad bladed swords. So some of them are, but. Um, most of the weird little quirks are fairly stylistic. They tend to have elongated ring guards, which is not typical on European swords, like, at all. Um, but they tend to. Most of the one-handed swords have ring guards. Um, which is weird, which is very, very, like I said, very atypical for European-style swords. Um, they also tended to have very little, um, well, what's called edge taper. Right? They, stay, they stay the same width until near the end and then eventually sort of taper to a point. Um, and they either taper to a point, or they have this they have this um, inset where it goes to a point and then either flares out and then cuts back in, or cuts in to a point, which that tells me that it's for, th it is, when it's for thrusting, it is for thrusting, but not piercing through. Uh, and this likely has something to do with the likelihood of fighting Darkspawn with poisonous blood that you do not want to get on yourself. Uh, also, it would be relatively better for a uh, a draw cut. Um, or even a, a more chopping cut. So that's thoughts. Some thoughts on the weird sword design from Dragon Age. And it's a very consistent style that's just outlandish and, uh, compared to the real world. It's not something that you find... Um, but again, I th I'm fairly certain it's it's all artistic choices. It's not like it's not they just goofed in their uh, uh, they were trying to do something specific and it just came out weird. But no, I think it is like specifically this setting kind of uh, kind of thing. What are your plans for this trip into the deep roads? Bartrand's running the show. On Traste's ass, he'd probably do that even if we weren't paying for everything. The tide we're looking for is supposed to be a week's travel from the surface, so I hope you aren't scared of the dark. We've got supplies, muscle, excavators. The plan is to carry out everything that's not nailed down. Anything in particular I should know about your brother? To understand Bartrand, you've got to understand the Dwarven Merchants Guild. It's gonna be a long These story. Are dwarves who would sell their mothers if they thought it'd get them a better share of the Lyrium market. Anyone who deals with them has to sleep with a knife under their pillow. In my family, that's Bartrand. That's a good sign, I suppose. If we'll be working together, I should find out more about you. True enough. <coughs> I suppose you want to Sorry. know my credentials. My family came from Orzammar, Noble House Tethrys, until my father got caught fixing provings. He and our whole house got exiled. No huge loss. I was born up here. Sunshine suits me just fine. Are you a merchant? A mercenary? I'm a younger son. It's a difficult and dangerous profession. A lot of us die of boredom. <laughs> Fortunately, being Bartrand's younger brother keeps me on my toes. Maker knows he lacks subtlety. I'm the one who pulls strings to keep the coterie out of our hair. Keep us just a whisker ahead of the other families. A lot of things can keep you awake, you know. I wouldn't reach for the doom first. Sure, I could have a cup of tea in the morning. But I hear it's bad for you. I've spent my whole life in Kirkwall. Dangerous enough most days, but it doesn't compare to the deep roads. So, this will be... Let's just call it an adventure, I guess. Great. Now we're adventurers. Hooray, adventurers! All right, let's uh, let's get out of here. Thank you very much for the help earlier, Varric. You made it back to the alienage in one piece, then? 
I don't know how I wound up in dark term. There are just too many corners in Kirkwall. Still got that ball of twine? I left it at my house. Don't worry, I won't get lost while we're following Hawk. Bring it next time, Daisy. Just in case. Kevin says, I would think lore-wise uh, that a significant amount of splatter-proof clothing uh, would be incorporated into the armor sets uh, when fighting Darkspawn. Yes, and uh, and face shield helmets especially. Because, um, you know, you don't want the blood to get into your system anyway, any way that it can. Um, it's not so much. Th then again, also, Darkspawn are, are not all that common most of the time when they're not facing blights. So, it's not that common of a concern, but it is a concern. Alright, let's... What do we need to do? What was this? Let's check this out. I forget what this is exactly. Yeah, that does seem reasonable, though, Kevin. See, some of the, some of the, some of the art design is not... Particularly Please quit cutting um, the based on lower town alone at night. Nothing ever happens. I'm perfectly safe, Farrick. Yes, I know. And that nothing is costing me a fortune. Send you to get me. Harriman's guards killed all my men. I thought I gave them the slip, but they found me. You tell Mirren, I never turned on him. I'm not going back until you can walk, limp, or crawl behind me. I, I think I can walk. You got it before Harriman's men could do much damage. Oh, good news. His rear guards saw us coming. They fell on us from all sides. Which any professional would have expected. That's him. That's Lord Harriman. Most of my enemies would not stoop this low. Are you working for Conrad Tooley? Perhaps Lady Reinhardt? What have you done that so many people want you dead? You sound Ferelden. Many in the city are. So you should know I'm the one who convinced the Viscount to send aid to Denerim. Many of my fellow noblemen resent that. They want me dead before he sends the money so they can reclaim it for Kirkwall. Will you kill me for this? Mm. Kevin says, I love the ice splash spell. Yeah, technically it's called a cone of cold, but it's not much of a cone. It is more like a splash. It is great, though. I do love it. Um... Yeah, no, let's not do that. We're going to make enemies, but no. This is not a job I can complete. Thank you, Ferelden. When I learn who sent you, I will be sure to leave you out of any retribution. I don't want to be the one to tell Mirren you did that. Well, thanks, I guess. Did just save your life, but, you know, whatever. It's probably fine. No, no. You would have been fine if I hadn't been here. You wouldn't have died or anything. Eh, no big deal. Anyway, what else we got? It's not here. Okay. 
So, interesting article I happened across today. Um, having to do with uh, one of the hottest topics, of course, of the last, like, full year. Uh, that being masks and such. And this is... um. If you saw me share it, I shared it on my personal page uh, on Facebook and also in the uh, in the politics and current events uh, channel on Discord. Um, I thought it was absolutely fascinating because it had a lot of a lot of points and a lot of um, uh, major revelatory um, uh, conclusions that I should have come to based on my based on my priors, right? Based on the priors that I have, but I really never concluded ultimately. Um, and so it was definitely worth checking out. And I, I want to get to a sort of discussion of it, but that's gonna I'm gonna have to loop back around to it. I'm gonna have to circle back to it because uh, in order to get there, I, I do want to uh, I do want to mention a few uh, other related things first. But let's talk to Thrask We've first. We found neither hive nor hair of the lad Fainril. I can only think he has fallen victim to demons or slavers. I found this. It was addressed to you. It seems to be from your daughter. My daughter? Then you know what she is. How she died. When I traced her to that warehouse, I should have forced her into the circle. My own weakness in the face of her pleas is what destroyed her. It is why I urged Ariani not to give in when Fainriel wished to hide. If only I had been so strong for Olivia. You have my sympathies. Do not fear the Templars finding out. Thank you. She is at peace now. I would not wish to see her name smeared while her ashes are still warm. Uh, P.I. is back from putting in uh, something in the Discord about the legions after the Marius reforms of 117 BC. Oh, okay. Interesting. I will definitely... I will definitely be checking that out after the, uh, after the stream then. That's outside of what I what I s put the most time into studying. Uh, most of my most of my uh, like I said most of my studies in uh, Roman history were were much much later, so like uh, third century or so onward. Um, yeah, Kevin can say it. I don't know. What's, I don't know. I don't know what to say there. Um, help wanted. Um. But yeah, like I said, uh, I I studied some basic, um, you know, uh, pre-imperial Roman Republic stuff, um, but but uh, not a whole ton. Uh, so uh, always always intrigued by more. Uh, citizens of Kirkwall, my dear wife Nanette has gone missing. I shall reward the person who returns her safely. Questions about the bounty or Nanette? Come speak to me in the High Town Market, Yislain de Karak. Or Ghislaine, yes. I need to find my wife. Ghislaine or Ghislaine? I don't know. What do you mean you can't help me? This is a domestic matter, Sirrah. If your wife has chosen to leave you, there's nothing we can do. Ninette is my wife. She's legally bound to me. Bring her back. We're done here. That's very Orlesian. French, in other words. Useless. Why are we still paying those sluggards? You should pay someone else. Like me. I like being paid. <laughs> if you can find me net, I will gladly pay you. That foolish woman has caused me nothing but embarrassment. She needs to be dragged home. The guards disagree. Mm, okay, that they sounds sketchy. disagreeable than my wife. Maybe your friend is more sensible. Her family is getting suspicious. They think I might have... <clears throat> done something to her. How do they think that? If, hmm? Well, I just want to make sure they know I didn't do it. Why would her family think you did something to her? They think I married her for her inheritance. And they know we have been fighting. They believe this is reason enough for me to hurt her. But I swear, on Andraste's pyre, I have done nothing. P.I. says he's always been fascinated by Roman history. I don't know why. I know why. It's because it's really, really interesting. Um, <laughs> really, it is. Uh, it's probably one of the most interesting, particularly uh, both, uh, particularly uh, from a 
sort of geopolitical standpoint, it's one of the most interesting periods in human history, particularly in the West. I love medieval history, but I will say it is... It's so much harder to keep track of, and it's so much less dramatic. Uh, talking about the, the the sort of back and forth squabbles of feudal lords, uh, as compared to the the massive scale politics of the Roman Republic and then Empire. I mean, the, the the political trends are so large scale; it's it's just fascinating to watch. Uh, excuse me, comparatively, you know. So, all right. So I have a question. Um, this is related to um, to a podcast from years and years and years ago. This is from like the early two thousands. Uh, the NPR podcast uh, back in the very early days of podcasting. Uh, this might have just been a radio play that turned into a podcast because uh, it's called uh, This American Life. Um, and this was John Hodgman before he was even on the Daily Show and before he does did whatever he's doing now. I have no idea. Um, comedian type. Um, <clears throat> you'll find a link to it in the description. Uh, and he asks what I think is a very profound question. If you could choose one of two superpowers, um, and the choice was between flying and invisibility, which would you choose? Now, I ask this question in a lot of my philosophy classes for a very particular reason, which I'll get to. Uh, and I've gotten lots and lots of interesting answers and a lot of discussion about it over the years, so, but I'm interested to see what you guys would say. Flight or invisibility? What would, you, what would you pick? If you could pick one or the other, you're the only one with the choice, you're the only one with the superpower, just, just you. Do you want to be able to fly? Or do you want to be able to turn invisible? And then I will get around to... Why this is relevant to some of the things we've been, we've been, some of the things I wanted to talk about. Yeah, I would go with flight. All right. Uh, feel free to let me know why as well if you want. Um, no, no, no pressure to, but uh, feel free to let me know why. Um, but this is worth discussing, I think. Why would her family? Think oh wait, I already asked that. They believe this is reason enough for me to hurt her. Do you think Nanette might be in trouble? It's her own doing. Gallivanting about with men half her age. <laughs> She's just trying to show me I am tied to her purse strings. Hmm. How long has your wife been gone? About a month. I wasn't worried at first. She's run off before. Ninette is uncontrollable, you see. She comes and goes as she pleases. You're more concerned what her family thinks than what happened to her. Ninette keeps the company of other men, huh? And makes no secret of it. I'll be better off with her gone. <sighs> well, as long as her family knows I had nothing to do with it, they would ruin me otherwise. I can't imagine why she'd leave you. You're such a pride. Yeah. It wasn't always like this. We were in love once. She defied her parents to marry me. Sometimes, I wonder if I dreamed those years. All right, fine. I'll try and find her. Um, at least to find out what's what happened. So Kevin goes with invisibility. Um, both are cool, but invisibility seems more useful for my purposes. What do you What do you mean exactly? I'm curious. Because that's 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 always an interesting question. Red investigator says I find uh, I just find it better uh, a better way to travel. Cuts out gas prices. Very true. Very practical. Very practical. Particularly interested though, Kevin. Why why invisibility? I'll try my best to find Ninette and bring her home. You should talk to Jethan at the Blooming Rose. I didn't know she visited whores. Until Jethan sent a letter to our house. He even sent her flowers once. Lilies. Hmm? Her favorite. Ah! Talking about it makes my head hurt. Good luck to you, sir. Erica says flight. You know where this conversation goes, though, too. So. 
Well, good luck to you then. So that might impact things. I don't know. We've had this discussion also, so there's that. It's all this then. Matcha. Have you please? Can you help me? My brother. What happened to your brother? Karen was always so devout. So idealistic. He was so proud when the Templars accepted him. I pleaded with him not to join the Order, but he wouldn't listen. You hear dark rumors about the Templars and Knight Commander Meredith. And now my brother is gone. What have you heard about the Templars? People harboring escaped mages just disappear. Templars interrogate and threaten passers-by. My friend has a cousin who's a mage. And she says he was made tranquil against his will. You hear more with every passing day. What do people say about Knight Commander Meredith? Oh, she has many admirers. They laud the service she does in keeping the mages in check. But others say she is terribly fierce and utterly without pity. But she sees demons everywhere. It is dangerous even to whisper such things. So, you think the Templars... what? Killed and ate your brother? Maker forbid. I don't know what happened. He just stopped writing me. Okay, Purple Hawk's a little I rude. I see him, but Knight Commander Meredith threw me out. They won't tell me anything. Your brother may indeed be in trouble. What can I do for you? Perchance, in your journeys, if you find yourself in the gallows, ask the other recruits, Wilmard and Hugh, about my brother. They were Karen's closest friends in the Order. If anyone knows where he is, it's them. Make her bless you and watch after you in this endeavor. Well, all right. Kevin says hunting would be awesome if you're invisible. Pranks would be absolutely choice. And if you wanted to be in a place without being spoken to, it's perfect. Say more about that last one. That one's interesting to me and relevant, I think. The first two, I will say, are very typical. And what I mean by that is that it, it, it matches very, very uh, straightforwardly with what um, uh, with what uh, the the podcast said, uh, what, 15 years ago now, uh, was a very, very common answer for invisibility. Then, and in a lot of cases since... Um, when I first started really asking this question, and even when it was asked of me as an undergrad, where I got a lot of these ideas, right? the common answer for people who chose invisibility was sly underhandedness. Right? Maybe not hunting in particular. Um, I, I mostly ask this question of urbanites, so yeah, maybe not there. But, uh, but for the most part, it's things like sneaking around, uh, getting things that you wouldn't be able to get, um, Pulling pranks on people, as as you say, um, uh, the, the the as the podcast says, things like sneaking into movie theaters and and spying on people. But then we have this other interesting bit that Kevin brings up at the end, and that's different, very different sort of motivation. Yeah, I says, uh, am I the only uh, am I the only one aggravated with people changing these uh, major figures in history's races? For example, like. Oh yeah, I saw an ad and they made Julius Caesar black or Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson's black. Yeah, Hamilton I think that's part of the point of it is the is the sort of inversion or the sort of almost shock value maybe. I don't know. Um that's that's artistic intent, right? And I can I can understand that. I can understand that. It's weird, I, I guess, but but that's artistic intent. Um the just sort of randomized casting decisions. Um one of the more one of the more silly ones was uh was a, a BBC presentation of um um I think it vaguely followed the Iliad and it was probably like thirty or forty percent black cast in the Iliad I think Achilles included Zeus as well which is very very strange 
Oh, Michael sees me on the screen and keeps uh, pointing and saying, Dada. Hi, buddy. How you doing? Oh, I can imagine. That's true, too. Uh, Private Investigator says, wow, my job would be much easier if I were invisible. And yet you didn't even think of that. You thought of the convenience and maybe even, maybe even the very human joy of flying. And that's why I would choose flight. Right. I've always had a, I've always sort of dreamt of flying. It would just be ineffably fun. Yeah. Oh, he's doing the wolf howl thing. He started like, oh, kind of thing. And it's adorable. It's absolutely the cutest thing in the world. Your family can rest. Kylie, what about you? Their killers are gone. Excuse me, who are... My post to the Chancellor's board? Did Her Grace let that stay? I thought for sure no one even read, but you say you've killed them. You have my eternal gratitude, Sirrah. It is comforting to think my parents might now rest easily in their graves. Who are you exactly? I am Sebastian Vale, Prince of Starkhaven. Her Grace might prefer I introduce myself as a brother in the Chantry, but I could not stay after what happened to my family. Who sent these mercenaries? My family has ruled Starkhaven for six generations. We have enemies, but none who would identify themselves openly. A distant cousin of mine is claiming rulership now, but he is... A bit simple. He can be no more than a pawn in this plot. Oh, jeez. Um, private investigator says I'm gonna. Yeah, he's gonna see if he can get his wife to sub to me. Awesome. I hope she likes. I hope she enjoys the content as well. Numbers are nice and all that, but uh, but I mean, mostly for the sake of of getting it out to more people who might find it useful and interesting. Um. All right. So Kevin says if you're invisible. Uh, in a place you can hear information without having to deal with people con uh, consciously concealing thing uh, certain things. Okay, so again, surreptitious, underhanded, got it. I don't mean that offensively. I just you'll see. It's it's in contrast to something else. Uh, more to the point, though, uh, just being able to observe behavior that wouldn't be observed in your presence. People behave a certain way in order to please me. Yeah, and that's that is kind of a truth of social interaction we 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 act a lot of our acts are performances and their performance is directed towards the specific people who are observing and that kind of thing oh kylie which would you choose uh if you could if you were offered a choice between two superpowers would you choose the power of flight or the power of invisibility and we've got some we've got some arguments and reasons over here too so feel free to peruse i suppose surely you have a guess as to who was behind it my parents were always prudent in how they handled our nobles they did not allow rivalries or resentments to flourish the attack must have come from outside kirkwall is our largest trading partner i came back here to find support for my claim and perhaps for a clue as to who is behind this foul deed why didn't your family's I enemies hunt accent. you down as well? That's why I took the offensive. Thanks to you, those Flint Company assassins are no Hi, longer Anne. a danger. Welcome. I'm the last of my line. Unless I survive, my family will have no justice. I hope their deaths bring you peace. Thank you. More than I can say. I truly did not expect anyone but me to take up this cause. Consider this in advance. When I have secured my lands again, you will be paid royally. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must meet with the Viscount and petition him for aid to a fellow city. I mean, a lot. Okay, so a lot of people whine about Sebastian that he was because he was a DLC character. He was very much a. He feels kind of tacked on in a lot of ways, but I really like his character. He's really, really interesting, and I just wish they had been able to give him more time. Uh, more sort of dedicated conversations, especially the interaction with the other uh, the other companions. Do you know a recruit named Karen? His sister is looking for him. We cannot speak to you, Messer. To the void with that. Karen and the others are missing. But our orders... The knights aren't doing anything to find them. Maybe it's time to ask for outside help. 
Wait, Erica, which NPC do you like? Sebastian or, or one of or one of our Templars here? Oh, Sebastian? Yeah, no, he's great. I like him. He's he's fantastic. I love his accent too. I believe it's Welsh, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. It's it's Actually no, I don't. I think it's um I think it's like Northern English, I think. It's either Northern Eng Northern English or Welsh. I'm not I'm really not sure. It's one of those it's one of those like non standard UK type things. I wasn't even certain Karen was missing. Who else is gone? The first ones disappeared weeks All right. ago. See you later, Anne. Thanks for stopping by. At least half a dozen. Wilmot and Karen were the most recent. Kevin says flight would be convenient, um, but it would inevitably lead to more imposition of service by people. If they know you can fly, they'll expect you to run more errands. Yeah, true, but same as you same as if you have a car. Um, I'd be maybe more concerned about like government experimentation or whatever, but invisibility might help you avoid that. Kylie says, ah, here we go. Here we go. Here's the contrast point. Thank you, Kylie. Perfect, 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 perfect. Kylie says, I'd, uh, I think I'd have to go with uh, invisibility because social anxiety. All right, here it is. Here it is. This answer. And if you want to elaborate on this, feel free, and I can, I can, I can talk about this more. Um, and private investigators says both would be equally helpful for me. Yeah, I... I, I in terms of just utility, neither one is a clear winner. You know, um, both allow you to do things you could not otherwise do, but they don't allow you like God mode, uh, right? They don't. It's not like in, like invincibility or super strength or the, the the Superman power set, right? It, they're one thing and they're relatively narrow, and neither would be amazing for you know being a superhero. Visibility wouldn't be too bad; it'd be doable. But just flight and no other superpowers, you're not going to go out and be a superhero, right? Uh, so it really just speaks to which of these is the, the more fundamental. It, it, it speaks to your character. It's more like a Rorschach test, you know? And the social anxiety point is a novelty. And I say it's a novelty because... In the origin of this, right? In the origin of this question um, on that podcast from, I th again, like I said, it was it was in the sort of early 2000s, um, or early to mid-2000s. It was a very long time ago, maybe 15 years or so. And it seemed like consistently the people who chose invisibility chose invisibility for underhanded things, right? Guileful, sneaky kinds of things. Maybe not necessarily criminal, but very often it would be. When I start, when I first started asking this question to my classes, uh, in like 2012, 2013, same thing. Until like 2015-ish, around 2015, I started to see a huge sea change in the reasons for. Okay, I'll cut it down. Um, I started to see a huge sea change in the reasons for, um, the reasons for. Uh, people choosing invisibility over flight. And it was a shift away from the kind of underhandedness, and it was more towards avoidance. Uh, Kelly says, plus, if I were invisible, uh, I could get into Broadway shows and watch them or be on stage and have a front row seat. That's, see, that's more typical. That's your standard invisibility answer. Uh, more so than than just kind of the avoiding avoiding uh, avoiding unwanted social interaction kind of thing. Like I got answers. Like this only really started in like 2015. I started getting answers from my undergrads of things like, so I could sit and I could read or study without anyone bothering me, or I could go places without being noticed, or I could go places without people without having to talk to people. Right? It was really that that kind of. I hesitate to just say introversion, right? Because introversion doesn't doesn't cover all of it, right? It doesn't thoroughly, fully cover um, the kind of uh, this this kind of drive to to avoid social interaction. Full stop. Hmm. To thoroughly avoid social interaction, not just to to limit it to a smaller circle, that sort of thing, but to, but to but to separate oneself out from from. Uh, social impositions, let's say. That was a very, very new phenomenon around 2015. 
which I've, I've very consistently put my finger on as a major period of cultural shift. And it really was around 2015 when we started seeing the started seeing our culture, and especially in America, but even just the, the Anglosphere and maybe even the West in general, really begin to shift and change in a lot of fundamental ways. A lot of people joke it was Harambe, it was the death of Harambe, but that was one of the confluence of factors, right? It was one of a that was one of many major things that 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 had these weirdly far-reaching cultural impacts in around 2015. Um. Oh no no no! Private investigator, we, uh, no no no. Uh, at will invisibility. You can choose to turn invisible, and you can choose to become become visible. Specifically. Um, P.I. asks, what specific Broadway show for Kylie? Kylie says, uh, any of them, honestly, but uh, most likely Phantom of the Opera or Beetlejuice. I didn't even know there was a Beetlejuice Broadway play. I didn't know that. Interesting. Um, but yeah, this was, like I said, this was very much a... Um, a major shift in in how people think about this question. <laughs> Kevin says you could sleep almost anywhere if you were invisible. Yeah, but what if someone sits or steps on you or runs you over? Careful about that. Why must you keep silent about Karen? You obviously aren't a Templar, Monsieur. A knight lieutenant gives you an order and you obey. Without question. Hmm. They told us not to breathe a word about Karen and the others. They must have their reasons. And that'll be a great comfort if you go missing next. Hmm. So recently, like the last two years. Phenomenal. Huh. I had no idea. Cool. You can trust me. I'm only trying to keep Karen safe. I hear that Knight Commander Meredith has some new initiation you have to go through. If you're not strong enough or fervent enough in belief, you don't make it out alive. Hmm. And you honestly believe that? Recruits keep going missing. Wilmot came back. What? He did. I saw him this morning. What else do you know about the initiation? You hear about some... <laughs> questionable things that the Order must do these days. The Knight Commander only wants Templars that can do... What must be done? And trust they alive. She's killing recruits that might question her orders, isn't she? That's rubbish. She wouldn't do that. If Wilmot came back, he might know more about the other missing recruits. I bet he would. Wilmot told me he was going outside Kirkwall. Clear his head, he said. Why didn't you tell us this? Knight Captain Cullen ordered it. Right before he chased after Wilmot. That wasn't too long ago. If you hurry, you may catch them on the road. All right. Well, let's uh, do that. May not have the best circle. Sounds like something to hurry about. Uh, that would be it. Uh, so... <laughs> uh, so, Private Investigator asked, do I know any Latin? Yes, uh, yes I do. Um, I can more or less read, uh, read Ecclesiastical Latin. Um, again, my, my, my area of specialization academically is in, uh, is in scholastic philosophy, and so I would hardly be considered competent if I couldn't read uh, a lot of the, the texts that I read in their original language, most of which are Latin. Um, I do also um, I do also study ancient philosophy as well, to some degree, um, and so I maybe eventually ought to learn um, more Greek. Um, but at the same time, my excuse for focusing on Latin, <laughs> for the time being at least, is that... Um, the the uh, my reason for studying the Greeks, uh, Plato, Aristotle, etc., is because the medievals read them. 
I will have the truth from you now. Mercy, this is what Colin looks mercy. like in this game, by the way. Were it that easy? Don't hit me. I will know where you're going, and I will know now. Colin doesn't look nearly as good as he does in the next game, but um, but yeah, like it's uh, it's it's kind of an obligation as for as for why i don't learn greek uh at least not immediately uh because most of the authors that i actually spend time studying particularly those in the middle ages read the ancient greeks in latin translation uh so i've actually had to go through and I'd ha i've had to find medieval latin translations of the uh of the texts of plato and aristotle uh for research purposes and actually see what what it was that the scholastics were reading because it's very different from modern translations, which are from Greek or the Greek itself. Right? And so any misinterpretation right, or any particular interpretation, even if it's not a misinterpretation, any particular interpretation, a lot of times you have to look at what language they're actually reading it in, which is in this case, Latin. Um, and I've had to do that in a few cases um, because I found some very, very strange interpretations um, among the medievals from my perspective. And my perspective is, you know, reading it in reading the ancients in english um translated directly from ancient greek with from uh professors who study it in ancient greek and so it's a very different perspective than what the medievals would have had which was translated into latin by primarily arabic scholars right, which again very very vastly different um Kevin says most of my time would be spent whispering things to people as they walk in creepy places. Funny story about that. So I, uh, one time I decided to do a bit of a social experiment on my college campus <clears throat> and I picked some people, mostly like tough, tough looking frat guys. Um, people who ordinarily would not be unsettled or scared, uh, especially not like mid afternoon on a college campus. Uh, and I wore a long trench coat with the hood all the, with the uh, with the with the collar all the way up, and it had a big collar, so it went up to like here. And I had a hat, and I pulled it all the way down. It looked like a like a comic book stalker, uh, and I would just follow them, just follow them, see what they do. This was not this wasn't crowded like on a crowded day, but it was uh, but it was you know how. Um, it was sparse enough so that if they looked, they could tell that I was following them. And I and I, I did it, um, I didn't, like, just kind of always walk towards them. I followed in their path. So if they, like, took a turn somewhere and then another turn, I would take the same turns. And in some cases, they were doing some very, very obvious things to try and shake me or to see if I was following them. Like, they'd cross the street and then they'd cross back. And I would cross the street and then cross back. And they would do a, a loop around a courtyard kind of thing. And I would loop after them. And as soon as, and like, once they started, like, like really, like, picking up speed and being really creeped out, I would just, like, oh, I'd just walk off the other direction and go to lunch or something. It was a lot of fun. And it, it, it really, it was surprising the the measures that people who didn't seem like they ordinarily would be afraid of such things would go to to avoid me with the with you know my coat with the popped collar and hat and stuff just walking around hands in my pockets just walking after them it was fun it was a lot of fun uh <laughs> so kylie said um uh, not really, na uh, except for the Latin needed for an exorcism, uh, and that is for my knowledge of the show, super show Supernatural. Uh, don't, don't try and exorcise your own demons. It's dangerous. Very dangerous. Um, Kyle says, I would whisper random things like, are you aware of your car's, of your car's extended warranty? Just, that'd be great. Just invisible voice. We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. Please press one for English. Just that'd be fun. That would be. I admit that that would be very fun. Uh, on which note, uh, Erica says, "Flight versus invisibility is how you tell who is a sociopath." Case in point, Kevin. <laughs> That's mean, but fair. Um, the PI says you probably look like Jack the Ripper running around a campus. Yes, um, that was kind of the point. I, I picked my creepiest clothing to do this. Uh, Kevin says you could uh, also terrify uh, criminals into behaving, saying, I'm watching you always, and you keep doing it to, uh, until they reform. That's true as well. True as well. Um, 
So let me see. Um, so this is Cullen, who we, we met in the first game. He was trapped in the uh, Circle Tower. He transferred to Kirkwall, and now he's going a little bit crazy. And then we'll see him in the third game um, in a different, very different context. I thought Templars only treated mages this badly. Nice to see you're branching out. This is Templar business, stranger. <laughs> you have struck me the last time, you pathetic human. To me! Hooray. Make her preserve us. Demons. Oh, jeez. I didn't realize there was one behind me. Got him. Oh, got some of them. Oh boy, okay. So, one of the, uh, one of the other points here that... You know what? Know what I'm gonna do? Turn both of those down slightly. That'll help. Uh, so one of the interesting... Ah, oh, jeez, really? Like I said, that this, uh, this change to... Uh, to the kind of, I want to be quiet and secretive and left alone. I knew. Seems to have only occurred recently. Involved in something sinister. But this, is it even possible? Do you think he was possessed? Normally we only worry that mages will fall victim to possession. I have heard of blood mages or demons in solid form who could summon others into unwilling hosts. I'd not thought one of our own would be susceptible. Kevin asks a very good question. Would it be possible to be a sociopath and be self-aware but then delude yourself into thinking that you're not? Probably? Maybe more of a question for the resident, our resident uh, psychiatrist or psychologist. Not psychiatrist. Psychologist in training, though, let's say. Kylie. Uh, I, that's outside my expertise, but probably my, my, um, my intuitions and what I do know say probably yes. So, anyway, um, let's, let's You shouldn't this have up. been out here alone with him. I am Knight Captain Cullen. I thank you for your assistance. I've been conducting an investigation of some of our recruits who have gone missing. Wilmard was the first to return. I had hoped to confront him quietly, out of sight. The recruits believed that Meredith was conducting some sort of deadly ritual. What? <laughs> That's preposterous! Recruits can be worse than a weaving circle with their rumors. There is a vigil before Templars take their arms, but the gravest danger they face is falling asleep. Uh, Kylie says, probably, um, like, if you're in denial about being a sociopath and deluding yourself into thinking you're not one, uh, would probably be, um, you're not, one would probably be a regular per uh, regular practice. Yeah? Although I tend to think sociopaths are a little more self-aware self than that, typically. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, um, maybe I'm going off of stereotypes there. If you didn't know he was possessed, why draw your sword on a recruit? He'd only been back a few days when he left again secretly. It set off some warning bells. I meant to scare him into a confession. He had to believe my threats were genuine. Do you know what happened to Wilmot while he was gone? Obviously more than I had anticipated. Wilmot has never been fully convinced of the Order's rules. 
Mages cannot be our friends. They must always be watched. I thought Wilmot might be meeting with some old friends who had escaped the circle. Kevin asks, so how would one really ever know for sure? I mean, diagnosis. It's like somebody else can help you with insights to your own mind that sometimes elude us. Introspection is, is imperfect. Sometimes an, ex an external perspective can be very helpful for things. I've got friends who are mages. Are you saying they need to always be watched as well? I was at the Circle Tower in Ferelden during the Blight. I saw firsthand how Templars' trust and leniency can be rewarded. I still have nightmares of Aldred's depravities. Oh no, Eric is making him self-conscious. Well, self-consciousness isn't necessarily a bad thing. Introspection, again, like I said, even though it can be imperfect, still probably overall a good thing. And yeah, Kylie, so therapy or this is another good point, a defining moment of sorts, right? So so an analysis of right, so a moment which forces you to confront your behavior one way or another. I was trying to find another recruit, a friend of Wilmot. Do you know where Karen is? He also disappeared. They were last seen together at the Blooming Rose. But I had no luck interrogating the uh young ladies there. I doubt they know anything of magic or demons. Uh -huh. Our investigator asks, Kylie, have you seen the channel JCS Criminal Psychology? It's very interesting. I have. I'm not familiar with it. I'm, I'm not at least. I don't know about Kylie. I don't want to answer. The order would truly be in your debt if you helped us with this. No one at the brothel will speak with me for fear I would shut them down for serving our recruits. If you learn what manner of creature did this to Wilmot, please come tell me in the gallows. I will ensure you are rewarded. He has ramen hair in this game, and I'm not a big fan. Everything here is cold. Hard stone. I wish I'd worn shoes with soles now. You didn't? No, you didn't. Elves. Alright, hold on. I'm gonna... Let's loot this. Ooh, got a room design. Alright. I'm gonna leave you guys right here for just a moment. If you'll excuse me. Um, I have to step away for just a moment and I'll be right back.
And we're back. What did I miss? Just realized you're welcome for not leaving the camera on uh, on the uh, ramen hair of Cullen. All right. All right. So what did I miss? I missed some things. Uh, talk about a lot more talk about sociopathy. Um. can't tell by the bad graphics. It's not so much the bad graphics as clipping. Her feet are clipping through the ground. That's the issue. Um, cloth shoes for sneaking. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I know links don't work in chat, but yeah, feel free to post things in the Discord and that'll work. That will work for that sort of thing. Again, if anybody watching is not in the Discord, the link to join our server is down in the description, so feel free to jump on, uh, jump on in right there. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, yeah, um, uh, Eric says our, uh, our normal Friday D&D game is, uh, not happening. We've got a, we've got a player missing, so, um, that means that me and Eddie, uh, that is Wizkid, are, uh, running through an endless dungeon until we die. Um... Go back and do more city stuff while we're here. Oh wait, no, we don't have more city stuff. Act of mercy. This is trying to find the. Uh... What were we trying to find here? I don't actually remember. Oh jeez, dragon link. Hello. You do get results, don't you? That's right. Um. So one of the uh, one of maybe I should say the consequences of uh, uh, of this point, right? That um, this growth in uh, I would say introversion, right? Uh, as a as a reason for choosing invisibility, introversion though is I think again a uh, maybe an oversimplification. Um, it's more, maybe like Kylie said, social anxiety, that sort of thing. Um. Ah, so Kylie's talking with her boyfriend about flight versus invisibility, and he's leaning towards flight for travel. Gotcha. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Um, it's another part of the reason why I, I lean towards flight myself. Um. The freedom that comes with it, you know? It's really something. Um, but I'll add, right, that, uh, Right, this, this, I think social anxiety is one way of putting it, but I, I would say something more like, um, social isolation or atomization that leads to a kind of discomfort. Oh god, this quest is so hard. I'm gonna save. I need to save, because this is very, this is a hell of a combat. Alright, I remember this. I remember dying so many times doing this quest. So uh, let me finish what I was saying, though, before I talk to him. Um, so it's a kind of atomization, right? That I think is in large part spurred, spurred by uh, by uh, the prevalence of online interaction as compared to in, uh, personal interaction, like personal social interaction. Um, and part of that, right, it, it leads to a kind of comfort in isolation a, and a discomfort with um I want to be precise here. Discomfort with regular social interaction um I would say with strangers, but maybe it would be more like unpredictable social interaction. Social interaction that is outside of one's control. People interacting with you right? seems to be the kind of thing which is which is more than anything else very uncomfortable, particularly for um, for young-ish people in the last six years, maybe a little more, right? And this is a 
strange new development, and I do think it has a lot to do with the prevalence of online interaction as opposed to in-person interaction, uh, and that the, the 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 sort of the default way of interacting being digitally, like this, in when one is in control. But this also explains our 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 generational aversion to phone calls. No one likes talking on the phone anymore. No one likes making phone calls. No one likes taking phone calls. Because, um, I'll actually, I have found a wonderful article about this. Um, uh, by uh, Jeffrey Tucker, who is a, um, a libertarian th uh, theorist and, uh, and philosopher and, uh, and musician, as it happens. Uh, liturgical musician. He, um, he does uh, chant, Gregorian chant. Um, but he, uh, primarily a libertarian theorist, but he does, uh, he had an article about this that, that we hate phones, we hate phone calls now, because it requires what economists call a double coincidence of wants, right? If I make, if I call you, it's, I am necessarily imposing upon your time. If you call me, you're necessarily imposing upon my time, because you're saying that I want this, I want this conversation to happen now on my terms. And that's the social you know, that's the, 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 the implication that's carried with it today, now. It's not so much the implication that was carried with it before, or like days gone by, right? A phone call assumes that both you and the person you are calling or being called by want to talk to each other at the same time. A text message or an email or whatever else is just there. You send it when you want, they read it when they want, they reply when they want, you read their reply when you want. It is to communication as money, as a medium, of, is as a medium of exchange in terms of economy. And I think that's his point, right? That, and that, that, that part of this is about, again, like I said, about about our social bubble. Right? We've cultivated these these little social bubbles around ourselves, where uh, where I want to be in absolute control of what is inside my little social bubble. Um, and which is why I call this, uh, why a lot of people will refer to this as social atomization. Right? I am an, I am, I am a sovereign little individual in my little social bubble. And when someone intrudes upon my little social bubble, I am greatly uncomfortable by it. And so in turn, my little social bubble does not want to intrude upon others and their little social bubbles. This is alien to human civilization. Um, welcome back, Anne. This is alien, especially to Western civilization, where Western civilization has always been um, interconnected. We have been sovereign individuals, and that's been a that's been that's come and gone over the years. But also, sovereign individuals in social relationships. Social relationships were an intrinsic part of our identity, which is a weird thing to say, right? Social relationship being intrinsic, intrinsic only in in in, in the sense of being being necessary and descriptive of who we really are. I would not be who I am without certain social relationships, for example. I think I can safely say that. But that's an uncomfortable thought for the modern mind, the modern atomistic mind. Modern sociopath, say, for example. Maybe that's that's putting it too far, but uh, but the sociopath is, is is an extreme example of the kind of phenomenon that that exists more benignly, right, in, in a lot of people. <laughs> Kevin says you could jump on a train, plane, or ship without any trouble if you're invisible. Holly said she tried that argument. Lol. Uh, boyfriend pointed out, pointed out, uh, I could just fly there, not have to go through the trouble of sneaking on planes or anything. Also, on the note of you know social imposition and social anxiety, you wouldn't have to deal with the people around you. Even if they can't see you, they can't impose on you. You're still around them. Now, here's the interesting thing. That might not matter. Being around them might not matter, might not make all the difference. <clears throat> if I understand this motivation re correctly, I think I do. I've made this argument for uh, for people who have chosen invisibility for you know reasons of called social anxiety, broadly speaking, right? And if they're not persuaded, typically, my students in the past haven't been, right? and other people I've had this conversation with haven't really been persuaded by this, because it's not about whether you're near a person or not near a person. It's about whether they are interacting with you or not. 
And so being invisible, interactions only being on your terms, is preferable to flying because of the visibility of it. And we go with flight too. I think we're we're sort of a majority flight chat, I guess. Flight, in my experience, does get the majority, but it's there's a slight edge in 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 my in my experience. Um, it's not overwhelming by any stretch. And maybe in part, maybe that's because I'm selling it that way because I I lean towards flight. So, brain yourself there. Um. Experimenter bias, I suppose. Right, but part of, um... Well, you know what? I'm going to have this conversation here. And then I'll carry it through to the next implication. Because there's more implication to this. Master Hawk, Ariane tells me you sought a better path than the circle for her son, Fainriel. I thought perhaps you would be willing to show mages a kindness once more. What? You can't be nice yourself? <laughs> you are no Templar. You cannot know what a badge of shame that would be. There are a number of apostates hiding in those caverns. And you've allowed this? I was hoping you might speak to the group. Convince them to surrender peacefully before my fellow Templars arrive. Do the other Templars intend to do worse than recapture the mages? Sir Caras is a knight lieutenant of the Templars, a great crony of Meredith. Should he find apostates hiding from pursuit, Meredith will consider him justified in murdering a lot of them. Who's Meredith? Oh, we didn't knew that. Have clearly not been in Kirkwall long. We knew this. Meredith but, oh well. is knight commander. She has changed the rules for mages in Kirkwall. They are less free than elsewhere. Though I dare say she has created as much dissent as obedience. Who are these apostates? Where did they come from? These are the mages of the former circle at Starkhaven. It burned to the ground and their Templars sent for us to relocate the survivors. Unfortunately, they escaped on the journey. With their phylacteries burned, it has been nearly impossible to track them. We know what phylacteries are, I'll just briefly summarize. They are samples of the mages' blood magically preserved so that you can track them magically. All right, I guess I'll help somehow at least. I would not like to see this become a massacre. Thank you. Your compassion does you credit. These mages have shown they attack Templars on sight. You have a better chance than I to convince them they are better off alive in the circle than free and dead. I mean, maybe. Sikaras hunts them as well. If they have not surrendered by the time he arrives, this will be a bloodbath. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's go check it out. Anyway, so this, the social isolationism, this atomization, um, is, hi, uh, excuse me, what are you doing? I didn't want this, this to happen. Um, so this social atomization right, that I've been talking about right, is, I think in large part, it winds up, um, oh, geez, Hawk's down. That's not great. Ow. Yeah, they're raising the dead. That's, that's not great. They're doing necromancy and blood magic. Let's, let's, let's tell them not to do that. Um, right, so this whole social atomization, isolationism thing, um, part of what makes this, uh, particularly relevant, right, is that in that article I mentioned, which you'll find linked in the Discord, in 
both in the Discord and in the description, um, and in my own my own Facebook page, um, uh, is that a lot of people, or at least I have found, and this this article has pointed out as well, uh, that a lot of people who are in favor of, and not just in favor of, but subjectively like masks, right? You know, face masky type things. Their reasoning is very similar to this social isolationism, atomization type of thing that I have found for desiring and wanting invisibility. That it's a kind of uh, anonymity. It's a kind of uh, a way of becoming anonymous and avoiding unwanted social attention. Right. No, Dan. Thanks for stopping by. See you next time. I thought I was going to die down here in this, this tomb. Are you with the Templars? Please, I need to go back to the Circle. I never Ooh. wanted to get involved in this. Well, okay. But we started making those, those things. Who is he? Decimus. It was his decision. He kept saying the Templars would label us blood mages if we fled. Why not use it if it's our best tool? He slit his wrist, and the magic, it rose from the blood and woke the skeletons in the cave. That's not good. I ran. Decimus is wrong. Blood magic is a work of evil, not just a power the Templars keep from us for spite. Decimus is the leader of these mages. He's crazy. He said with our phylacteries gone, no one could find us. We would be free. I think maybe he set the fire. There must be a demon working through him. No normal man would profane the dead like this. Alright, so let's, um... Before we make our, our decision, I, I, I want to finish this thought, too, right? So, so in the article, there, there's a lot of quotes, and this is, this is similar to a lot of things I've been seeing over the last year or so, right? People who like wearing masks and like other people wearing masks because... Precisely because of the limits it places on social interaction... Right. right. If you are if you are concealing your face, and there's a reason that this is not a common cultural practice before the last year, right? at least not in the West. If you're concealing your face, you are anonymizing yourself and cutting yourself off socially from people around you. Right. So there are people who who the the article has a series of quotes on this. One of the right near the beginning, actually, and I highly recommend checking it out. Again, like I said, in the description down there. Um. Where it quotes people saying things like, I like wearing, I like having my face covered um, because it, um, because I don't have to put on a performance, or I don't have to pretend to smile, or I don't have to keep a neutral expression, or I don't have to greet people, or whatever it might be, right? Uh oh. I don't know if you guys might have missed a thing or two there. I saw a connection cut out. Let me know if there's more issues, if, that, if it cut out, or if I need to re repeat anything. Sorry about that. Um, right, but part of this is that it allows... I can understand the desire for that sort of thing, but I think it speaks to a kind of uh, social pathology. I mean, a kind of, a kind of breakdown of of organic social connections, right? Organic and, I would say, uh, uh, spontaneous or random even social connections. The kind of connections where where if if you just happen across somebody and you say, hey, how's it going? They'd say, pretty good. Pretty good, thanks. Or pretty good, you? Oh, good, thanks. Conversation done. It wasn't really a conversation, right? But it was a polite greeting and it was a kind of interaction. And it's the kind of thing that that covering our faces almost necessarily prevents. Right. Um, and okay, so Kylie says one uh, one reason I may, I, I like masks sometimes is because no one can see what expressions I make. Um, I, I can I can see that right. I can understand that sort of thing. Um, but even still, right? So, uh, barring extreme circumstances and and. Maybe there are some extreme circumstances that we can that we can set aside here, but barring extreme circumstances, right? Somebody else's expression when you're when you're when you're just passing by, 
can be a very large portion of our communication with one another, especially in a passing, uh, sort of just social passing setting, right? If you're not going to have a conversation with someone, seeing what their expression is can tell you whether to have a conversation with them. If somebody looks grouchy, if somebody looks like they're having a bad day, then it might be worth your time to be nice to them. At the same time, it might be worth your time to not ask them, uh, you know, which aisle you can find milk if you're at the store, right? Or whatever. I mean, I, I, my mind goes to grocery stores because it's most of the social interaction I get um, <laughs> during the summer when it's not in uh, when school's not in season. Um, but things like that, right? Without that indicator, we really are sort of isolating ourselves into these little bubbles. But that a lot of people, a disturbing number of people, prefer it that way. And prefer it that way and, and, and will, 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 will want to continue this as a social practice. right? Far beyond any usefulness it may or may not have um, concerning, you know, um, spreading of diseases and such. Far beyond any actual reasons for sanitation or public health. Now I get it. There, those those uses themselves are open to lots of debate. Uh, that unfortunately is a debate which is not really apparently allowed on the YouTubes. Um, but you know, look into it. Um, <laughs> but all of that aside, right? That is in large part not why a lot of people are comfortable wearing masks and interacting with other people who do so. The reason they're comfortable doing so is for, specifically for, the kind of social disintegration that it causes. And this is something I brought up well over a year ago. Um, if you haven't been around this long, uh, I cut a piece out of, out of one of my streams, out of my, one of my uh, Red Dead streams, um, talking about... Uh, the, the social consequences and the social effects of, of covering one's face and the social purpose of covering one's face. And, uh, and I, I will recommend you to go check that out. It's Arthur, War Arthur Morgan Wears a Mask. Um, because if you think about it in the context of Red Dead, right, of, of the Old West, why do you put something over your face? Well, you got two reasons, really. There's a lot of dust. You don't want it in your lungs. Or more likely, you're about to do something antisocial. And you want anonymity. We all know, and we have known for two and a half millennia, the stark consequences of anonymity for social moral behavior. Right? This goes back at least to uh, Plato writing about the Ring of Gyges in the Republic. Where uh, if we have the capability of turning ourselves invisible or becoming imperceptible or even just becoming anonymous, then that necessarily means that we are capable of and therefore we are tempted to antisocial behavior right, to a dangerous extent. So all of this really, and this, this, this article really brought a lot of this together for me that I hadn't really thought of. Um, but, but this cultural shift has led to a society that is not even not just willing to accept um, masking for the sake of public health. Again, if that's if that is effective, right? Regardless of whether it's effective or not, right? It's led to not only a society which is willing to accept masking for the sake of public health, but is um, will actively pursue it for its own sake, for its own social purposes. And again, this is something that I've noticed for years since, like, like I said, 2015 or so. I've noticed this very odd cultural shift um, towards a kind of atomization, a kind of uh, a kind of desire for anonymity, desire to keep away from imposed social interactions and stuff like that. And I've noticed a kind of weird cultural uh, cultural dichotomy with respect to, to masks and all and everything involved with it. But I had never thought to bring the two together until I read this article. Until I heard someone refer to a mask as as their invisibility cloak. That's what made it all click. Because I think there is a lot to this. And there is a huge, huge um, cultural impetus behind all of this. 
And it, it, it should be fairly unsettling because I can understand individuals having a kind of preference for, uh, for avoiding imposed social interaction. I can understand that impulse and I can understand the psychology behind it. The trouble is when that becomes a social phenomenon, a widespread, pervasive social phenomenon. That's when it gets extremely, extremely dangerous because that's when the society itself begins to splinter. So private investigator says the reason I don't I dislike them is they aren't really healthy to wear, uh, and everyone is so is so socially awkward around them. For me, it's more the latter. I've got two young kids who need to see faces, right? Developmentally speaking, uh, my kids are one in three. They need to see faces on a very regular basis in order to understand what being human is like, you know. And uh, and if again, this is one of those things where if I if I weren't living in Florida, I would be. Uh, I would be in severe, um, I would be severely discomfort, uh, uncomfortable, um, with, uh, with their development. It's because here people are more or less normal and they're, they're able to interact face to face with people. Um, college campuses aside, which are islands of insanity, but whatever, I've talked about that. Um, but there are a lot of places where, where I am, I'm very, very afraid for the developmental, um, the developmental outcomes for for kid for kids who are growing up uh, this year, this year and last year. I think that we're going to see very stark long term consequences, as well as for education. Right? I've I've I have unfortunately, um, I'm very sad to say this. I've failed far more students in the last year than I ever have before, and for the most part, it's not because. I've had just less competent students. It's not because my classes have gotten harder. If anything, I've made them intentionally easier. But it's simply because um, of the, 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 the difficulty, the, the psychological, mental health type of difficulty of, uh, of keeping up with things in, in conditions like we're under now. It, it's, it's absolutely disastrous. Um, I, I'm... I'm <laughs> I... Let me say one thing. I, for example, I would be absolutely terrified to uh, find out that in 20 years from now that my doctor was in medical school in 2020. That would be deeply unsettling to me. Or even hell, an undergraduate in 2020. I would not be uh, not be happy to learn that. Private investigator says in Michigan it's really uh, really mixed. The big cities are very very pro mask. Up north, no one likes them. Yeah, and I've heard. Terrible, awful, no good things about Michigan. Um, especially with the Wicked Witch of the Midwest as your governor. So, you know, there's that one. Hey, maybe she'll get Cuomo'd. I mean, Me Too'd. I mean, whatever they're calling it. Anyway. The Templar Thrask is waiting outside. Surrender to him and you won't be hurt. I surrender. Take me to the Templars. I don't want anything to do with this blood magic. The rest of them, they're still following Decimus. He's gone mad. I think he'd kill us all just to take the Templars down. Well, all right, let's, uh... Let's move on. Raising the dead. Necromancy. You know, when somebody proposes, hey, let's just raise an army of undead to uh, to help us in our... Actually, you know what? Um, oh, jeez. Come on. What is this? There we go. All right. Um, I will say that a lot of this, a lot of the themes of this game are about well-intentioned extremism going terribly, terribly wrong. Um, and this is just one... Very clear example of it, but it's only one. Uh, because there are a lot of well-intentioned pro-mage extremists in this game. And also a lot of well-intentioned Templar extremists. They're here! The Templars have come to take us back to the Circle! Decimus, no! Stay your hand! These are no Templars! What do I care what shield they carry? If they challenge us, the dead themselves will meet the call! Well, that's not good.
Let's do a fireball. Come on, really? Oh, I can't, I can't heal Doggo. That's not great. All right. Is that it? Did I get them all? I got them all. You killed him. Oh, Decimus. <sighs> you should have listened to me. Oh, I saw what you are. How could you murder one of your own just for daring to defy the Templars? You think he brought those skeletons to life to serve me tea? I warned him. I told him once he marked himself as a blood mage, that was all anyone would see. She won't admit it, but it's obvious she's just as corrupted. OP, I, I don't worry about it. That happens. I have had no truck with demons. Please, we only want our freedom. Without your help, the Templars will execute us all for Decimus's crimes. Um, yeah, so P, I, um, I know Erica does that all the time, um, because she often will uh she'll often be having to do other things with the kids and stuff um and uh one great solution to that i will i've always found was just hit double speed and just catch up real fast if you can track what's being said at least um if not see. in the circle how do you intend to live i hear there are places outside the free marches where the templars are not so vigilant why not it's not like i'll be joining the templars anytime soon then we must first throw off pursuit. There is a Templar who followed us. You must have met him when you entered. Kill him, and we can get clear of Kirkwall before the Templars send more men. We should help them. We don't know what this good-hearted Templar truly intends to do. They would have us kill a man for doing the just work of a Templar. Mm. Will you buy us time to flee Kirkwall? I'll lie. How about we lie? Let's do that. Leave it to me. By the time I'm done, these Templars will swear that the sky is green. Your confidence almost makes me believe you. But I spent two weeks traveling with these Templars. They strike first and think after. They are far mm. easier to kill than to fool. my most awkward life experience? That is a massively big question. Oh, man. Um, most of them when was are from when I was a young child. Uh, so... Mind if I try my hand at yes, that? please do. I, upped your, I increased your cunning, so maybe Easy. you can do it now. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. Um... Yeah, most of my most awkward experiences were from when I was a little kid. I was an I was a fairly awkward little kid, so maybe that, maybe more than. Um, hmm. Oh jeez, I'm gonna I'm gonna limit it to things that don't just simply involve uh, now you fall. like gross out type things. Um, and I'll have to say probably. So I think it was. I would probably say was one of the one of at least one of the most awkward awkward things I experienced was uh, when I lost my first tooth. 
Um, so when I lost my first tooth, uh, I was, um, I don't know, sometime in elementary school. It was during summer school. It was a, it was a, uh, like a summer camp type, um, program thing. And I was, uh, it was at a, um, it was at a, uh, uh, some kind of a school thing. It was, uh, it was one of those like, um, uh, science-y summer program things. It was pretty cool. Um, but what it, uh. I was I was uh, almost late to get there that day. Um, uh, I had to go like all the way across this this uh, this school's campus or whatever. And I was going really really fast, and uh, I was walking really fast. I was a little kid. Um, I didn't. I wasn't watching where I was going because of course I wasn't. I was an awkward little kid. Um, and so uh, what wound up happening was I ran headlong into a pillar. Uh, like a big concrete pillar. Smashed, face first. Oh, Erica, that's a good point, too. That's more recent, I suppose. I'll get to that. that that's another story I can tell. Um, but, so I ran face first into a pillar. And my tooth fell out. It was already a little bit loose, but it wasn't... It was probably not loose enough. It should not have fallen out. So I was, like... Walking, 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 facing this way, facing this way. Bam! It was, uh, I think it was my eye tooth. This boy is Popped right out. The apostates. I ran away when they began to use blood magic, sir. They are not in the caverns, Sakaras. I was absolutely terrified that, one, that I was hurt and I shouldn't have been, and two, that I was going to be late and that I was bleeding profusely from my mouth, which was... It was very awkward. Uh, and then also, because I happened to be looking over there, I happened to be seeing, like, a teacher who was also walking across, the like, the other side of a courtyard or whatever, and she sees me smash headlong in, and I ran. I just ran away. I have no idea whether she saw me hit the wall or not. Probably. Uh, but I just ran off, because I was, I was, like, awkward and embarrassed, and I didn't want to have that happen. That was fun. Also, Erica's story. This is a good one. This was also another very awkward thing. Um, so Kylie said, uh, my life's been a lot of awkward experiences, to be honest. Y'all, uh, I made the log off early. Oh, all right. Well, we'll see you next time. Um, yeah, so we had, uh, uh, so we kind of liked each other. We went to the uh, went to the Renaissance Fair together. Uh, on the way back, uh, she was uh, on the way back to drop me off in my dorm. This was in college. Uh, I awkwardly asked, so are we dating are we dating now or something like that? And she laughed. She is not exaggerating by this. She laughed for a solid several minutes. Could not answer. She could not get an answer out uh, until eventually, uh, and eventually, I mean, yes, but are. it was... What's the trouble, Sir Thrask? We're very Did awkward people. Did the commander forget to tell Sir Karras that Enchanter Hawk came from Ferelden to help her root out rebel mages? Uh, yes, yes, I was just about to tell him. We've completed our investigation of the mages in those caverns. There is no one left inside. The apostates resorted to blood magic and ended up turning on each other. Their leader fled the battlefield ahead of us. Bloody coward left his own people to die. I uh, caught only a glimpse, but it looked like the back passages led out to the coast. I sent your men that way. We can still catch up if we go around the caverns. That's the faster route. The coast, you say? Men, fan out, search the shore. We will retrieve these corpses later. I will commend you to the Knight Commander, Enchanter Hawk. It is rare to see a mage cooperate with authorities. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> that was, that was a good lie. Truly, Very good lie. Able to charm a miser out of his last coin. I did not think any of us would leave those caverns alive. Also, yes, it was cruel, and I had I, it was incredibly awkward to have laughed in my face for a while. Um, but that was the story. That was the story, Kylie. That was it. That was it. That was it. That was really all there was to it. Um, but apparently, I was very pathetic sounding. So you know, justified. That was it. That was the story. Um, there was also the story of how we met, which, uh, because, you know, both awkward nerds, we met at a Star Wars LARP. It was, it was uh, Erica's first night there. I'd been there a while. Um, I showed up halfway through, 
Um, I had no idea what was going on, but apparently there were these these big scary monsters played by NPCs. They were NPC, non-player characters. Um, why did I explain that? Uh, big scary monsters that we probably could not fight and could not beat, at least not one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and it being Erica's first night, she didn't even have a lightsaber. Wasn't you not allowed to have one first night because the older players hate new players, I guess. Uh, in this LARP, they did at least. It has since fallen apart, of course. Um, but, uh, so she sees one of these monsters. Uh, she, she says, she yells to me, go, I'll hold him off. And then I start running off and she starts to run wildly. Ah! with no weapon or anything at the big scary monster. Big scary monster just goes kills her dead. And I turn around no! And I charge back and I fight and I fight and I fight and I get myself killed anyway. That's That was it. From there, it's history. If it makes you feel better, officially you were killed during escape. I will do my best to seem cold and rotted then. <laughs> Please, accept my staff. What's with the reward. facial tattoos? It has the mark of Starkhaven on it. I dare not carry it now. It has served me well. Now, we must flee as far as we can before nightfall. Thank you, friend. I'm glad I could help. I didn't have to kill all of the... <laughs> All of the Templars this time. That's good. Last time I did, and it was awful. Last time I played through this, it was that was that was the hell part. That was the part that took forever. Anyway, short version of how we met. Uh, she died to save me, and then I died anyway. That was how that went. That's the short version. Kylie <laughs> says, oh my gosh, I'm dead. So was I. Um, all right, let's... Uh, oh, jeez. Let's help Isabella, because I promised we would eventually actually recruit our full party tonight, and we have like 35 minutes left or less. So let's actually go help Isabella, because, you know... I said we would do that. Um, that's the one. Mirren. Loose ends. Shepherding wolves. What was that? Who was shepherding wolves? Oh, this is the Kunari thing. Okay. Yeah, we should do that too. Yeah, I know. Main quests are important. I get it. <laughs> This isn't where we were supposed to be helping Isabella, was it? So, Gustav limped back here, but uh. refuses to speak one word of what happened. Spit it out. Is Harriman dead or not? Let's just lie. He was gone by the time I got there. I just killed his guards. <laughs> I thought you were better at this. Guess nothing happens if I don't do it myself. Forget the bounty. But here's a bit for bringing Gustav back. If you're up for more of this sort of work, let me know. I can make some arrangements. I mean, okay. That's still a gold. That's that's still decent pay. So, Alright. I'm really glad, our, uh, glad the story is entertaining. It must be clean with no ties. It... Hawk! It was Hawk, right? From the streets. You took the Canari from the city? Without incident? You know what we faced. Mind your tongue, Ferelden. Please. God, his face do is... speak your mind. His face seems to have been hit by something frying pan shaped. Don't string me along. You know that I know. Whether you believe it or not, I wished you no harm. That might have been useful for someone, but still regrettable. A massacre of citizens protecting a slave might have forced the Chantry to doubt appeasement, to see the Kunari for the monsters they are. 
Perhaps finding the mage was a rushed opportunity. If such a plot existed, I see how it might be disagreeable to you. Jesus. Your Ketogen killed himself rather than be free. I assumed he wanted to escape, just as I would. My pity is genuine, but they are not like us. If, perhaps, why dance around this lie? I'm standing right here. If a member of the Chantry admitted instigation, I have no doubt it would result in more appeasement. But an accusation from a low town thug, you are hardly that important. Mm. That's not an insult. It's why I chose you. Rest assured, excuses, real or imagined, are not for your benefit. I'm not a fan of her. I have no allegiance to Kunari. You lost a potential ally. Perhaps, but I will not risk these kinds of relationships again. Take your pay and be gone. I am new to this, I admit. But someone has to think of eternity. The peace will not last. I mean, yes, fair point, I suppose. Um, she'll be trouble. But yes, she'll also be trouble. Without a doubt. Miss anything in here? No. Let's go. Where are we supposed to help Isabella? Let me actually look this up, because... Oh, I still got to talk to Anders. And then Fenris. Hightown. Oh, well, all right. Got to go to Hightown after dark. Why is she meeting someone to duel in Hightown? What is this about? All right, whatever. Let's go. You, Kylie, what do you mean you won the discussion with your boyfriend? Does that mean you convinced him to pick invisibility? Or because you can, I mean, people can pick different superpowers. That's fine. That's a thing. Oh, God. For sheer stubbornness. Oh, jeez. All right. There's a lot to do up here. Um, I'm going to kind of prioritize Isabella, though. I did kind of promise, and then, then Fenris. Um, like I said, I did pretty much promise to pick up my entire crew. It's in the thumbnail. I can't just not do that. Is this it? Yeah, there we, there we go. Right here. There she is. Perfect. There you are. I've been here for hours. Ada hasn't shown up. No one has. I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> That's right up there with... What could possibly go wrong? That's the wench we're looking for. Gut her. Okay, well, that was a great time to pause. Jesus. I love Rogue's combat style in Dragon Age 2. Like, it's very flippy. It's very hard-hitting. Kylie says, uh, My boyfriend and I kind of admitted we had feelings for each other one night uh, when we were driving around, uh, but both of us had thought we heard the, uh, heard the other wrong. <laughs> so we had... Uh, I don't know what VC means voice chat uh and talked and actually confirmed jesus okay well that's that's not as awkward i think i've got you beat but not by too very much Hader sent hiding in the chantry and sending thugs to finish me off coward he'll not get away with this come on all righty then let's go that's Oh, I thought that... No, okay. I was thinking the Viscount 
residence was the uh, chantry. It's not. Um, all right, investigator, welcome back. Uh, you missed a few things. Um, uh, I was talking about awkward stuff. Um, feel free to go back and sort of rewatch and double speed. You, you should be able to catch up. It's just fine like that. Um, but I was uh, I was talking about uh, primarily how uh, um, Eric and I were talking about how we met and uh, and how I didn't even quite ask her out properly at first, which was incredibly awkward. You can scroll up, you can see it in the uh, in the chat too. Um, oh jeez, this is good. Uh, and just generally awkward moments. Primarily, of course, having to do with love and dating, but then also, um, I don't know if you missed the uh, my uh, story about losing my first tooth. That was also a pretty good one. Kelly says, I won uh, I won because he couldn't think of another reason, uh, and I brought in the different types of invisibility, so he gave up. So, um, check out the, uh, listen to the, I would, again, I would totally say listen to the podcast. It's already in the description, so definitely give that a listen. He gives, um, uh, Hodgman, he gives, uh, he gives specific sort of rules for how the powers work. Isabella, Speaking of high heavens. Probably Tell sleeping. Men to burn the letters next time. Castillon was heartbroken when he heard about the shipwreck. You should have let him know you survived. It must have slipped my mind. <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay. Where's the wreck? I lost it. Castillon's just going to have to do without. Lost it? Just like you lost the ship the of the AC. cargo. They weren't cargo, Hader. They were people. Those slaves were worth a hundred sovereigns a head, and you let them scurry off into the wilds. And now the relic's gone too. Castillon won't be happy to hear that. I promise you. Will someone explain what's going on? Isabella's been a very bad girl. Ruined a perfect business deal, and then ran away. She didn't tell you? I told him enough. Somehow I doubt it. <laughs> I said I arranged for a duel, which I did. I also said you wouldn't play fair, which you didn't. We can talk later if you want. Right now, we have other problems. So, uh, it looks like she uh, freed a bunch of slaves that were her cargo. So I'm getting huge Jack Sparrow vibes here. Uh, I already was when she talked about being a captain but not having a ship kind of thing. That, that was already there. Um... But also somehow lost a relic or threw away a relic. There's something about a relic. Which will probably become important later. Castillon isn't a very happy person, is he? Maybe he needs a new hobby. There's only one way to settle this. Ooh. Well, okay. Uh, that does the job, I suppose. Okay, yeah, voice chat. That's kind of what I thought you meant, but I don't know what the kids are saying these days or what it means. Put a fight down. Trust me, it's better this way. Castillon won't hear about me from Hader, but he'll find me eventually. I just have to get him the relic. 
Simple as that. What's so interesting about the relic? I don't really know what it is, except that it's ancient and worth my weight in gold. Castion has me chasing it down as payback for freeing his slaves. <sighs> to be honest, I think he just wants me dead. But that would be letting me off easy. Jesus, Kevin. Kevin says, I will have met my partner in an Emperor Palpatine fan club. We will both be in hiding in the shadows and simultaneously will cackle and look up to scowl at each other. Then, marriage. <laughs> I mean, listen, I, I did literally meet my wife at a Star Wars LARP. So, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh... You hired Lucky to track down information on the relic. See. That's right. He insisted he knew everything that was going on in Kirkwall. He lied. <laughs> I bet he doesn't even know everything going on in his pants. I don't know. <laughs> he says, that would be awesome and y'all should wear full Star Wars garb at the wedding and require everyone to do so as well. I did think about it. Um, uh, Private Investigator, live action role playing. Uh, live action role playing game. So, so you know, swinging plastic lightsabers at each other and shouting force powers and things like that. Who is Castillon? He's a powerful merchant based in Antiva. I believe he has ties to the Felicissima Armada. I used to work for him. But the jobs mostly involved smuggling lyrium, jewels, or the occasional criminal acquaintance. He paid well. Yeah, so typically foam swords and things, but in this case, plastic lightsabers. Did you end up in Kirkwall because your ship was destroyed? There was a storm. The ship ran aground on the reefs near the city. I managed to make it to shore. Most of my men weren't as lucky. Poor sods. I knew some of those men almost ten years. Ah, balls. I I did a I did a few LARPs back in college. It was a hell of a lot of fun. What's this about you freeing slaves? I was asked to escort Castillon's cargo ship. I got a bad feeling about the job partway through. Boarded the ship to find slaves. Nearly two hundred. Elves, humans, children even. It was sickening. They paid Castillon to take them away from the Blight. He took their money and sold them into slavery. Even I know that's wrong. Didn't expect that, did you, Guardsman? Jeez, she actually looks... cowed by that. Embarrassed. Kevin says, yes, heart. A full cadre of stormtroopers will fire live rounds into effigies of, effigies of Jedi constructed of watermelons. Okay. I'll happily attend, but... <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Private Investigator says, I've always wanted to uh, wanted an ancient-themed wedding because it would uh, would have been unique, but uh, my wife wanted it traditional. Yeah, we... Uh, I mean, simple, relatively simple church wedding, and honestly, we wouldn't have even had a reception if it weren't for both of our families, like, insisting and arranging it for us. Ellie says, Yes! Uh, and one of the wedding games would be shooting watermelons with fake blasters. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I like the idea. Of, I like the idea of themed weddings a lot more than the actual themed weddings. I don't know. It it can. I'm 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 sure it can be a hell of a lot of fun, or it can be tacky. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, yeah, let's help. Let's do it. If getting the relic gets Castillon off your back, then I'll help you retrieve it. I still don't know where it is, but you'll be the first to know if I hear anything. Hey, anyway, yeah. thanks for helping me out with Hader. I think I'll tag along for a while. There might be something I could do for you. And I have a room at the Hanged Man if you're looking for company later. 
<sighs> anyway. Um, yeah, let's... Nah, we don't need to bring her for now. That's fine. I've pretty much got my settled party here. Uh, aside from... Uh... Aside from going to the deep roads. That is going to be a very, very different party. Not entirely different, but mostly different. Um, yeah. Varric, Anders, and... Um, Carver. Once we do that, it'll be maybe next week we'll get to it, but I'm not, no guarantees there. Um, Kyla says, I would prefer a more traditional wedding, but I go back and forth between wanting to be outside or inside. Uh, if it was in a barn, that would be awesome. I mean, there's always, there's always nice traditional tr inside church wedding and then, then wacky fun reception. You got options. That's a, that's a thing you can do. Um, where the heck is Fenris's mansion? There it is. Let's go up there. Because he wanted us to come and hang out. Our investigator says, I just pictured Darth Vader walking out with the Imperial March playing in the background. <sighs> he would be the flower girl. I don't know about that, but okay. I guess. That'd be funny. That'd be really funny. I I'd love to see it. Darth Vader with a, with a uh, lightsaber in one hand and then stirring flowers in the other. Yeah. Yeah, no, I could see it. I could see it. Uh, or, I guess, maybe more realistically, Kevin Simpson's best man, I, I suppose. If you want to be boring and traditional. <laughs> Either way. Uh, honestly, if you wanted to be wacky and crazy. Darth Vader Flower Girl. Not a bad idea. Agrigio Pavali. There are six bottles in the cellar. Denarius used to have me pour it for his guests. My appearance intimidated them, he said, which he enjoyed. Nothing like a bit of fear with your wine. That's what Daenerys used to say. Oh, sorry. Really? It's good I can still take pleasure in the small things. You could have offered me a glass first, you know. There's more, if you're really interested. Perish the thought. How else would you redecorate the walls? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I've wanted to leave my past behind me, but it won't stay there. Tell me, have you never wanted to return to Ferelden? Kevin says, dude, I'm boring and traditional. It would be a delightfully ominous occasion. I've started a life here. And that's you it. Is Adams? You leave it behind so easily. I lost my sister to the blight. And now she no longer matters to you? I apologize. Your life is your own. It simply sounds very familiar. Kindly says, nice. I don't know if I turn into a bridezilla, though. I do have those tendencies and want the wedding to be perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems to me that leaving most of the planning to third parties uh, and just, like, giving that trust over uh, is probably the most mentally healthy way to go about it. Do you intend to keep living here? I haven't decided. For now, it's as good as any other place. I would return to Zaharon if I could, but... There is no life for me there. Kevin says I'm at least as romantic as Gomez Adams. That's really saying something. Is that where you're from? So I've been told. <laughs> Erica says about his voice, it's way too deep and scratchy for a short, tiny little elf. Little stick elf. Sorry. Um, Pride Investigator says, yeah, I'm kind of glad we picked traditional. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a uh, traditional wedding. You really just can't go wrong, you know? And it's not like... It's not like you'll ever regret it, really. You might regret having a cringy wedding. You won't really regret having a traditional wedding. Uh, maybe it won't be like the big spectacle. But that's fine. You're married. That's important. That's the important part, right? Um... Kylie, that's a good idea. Uh, traditional wedding winery for the reception. Um, 
Private investigator says, I'm watching this Ides of March reenactment, and it's so, so, so bad. Oof. Um. I don't know, it's hard to act dying. Especially being stabbed by lots of people at once. It's hard to do that dramatically in, in a believable sort of way. Were you very young when you left then? Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay, fine. That's not an answer. You could track your former master down, I assume. I imagine he has returned to Minrathus, though I dare not go near the city while he is alive. No, it is better to wait for him to leave his fortress, fight from a fortified position. I do not expect your help when that day comes, but I would not turn it aside. Excuse me. Those feathery pauldrons are reminding me a lot of some of the um, some of the character art from the Dragon Age Four trailers. Some of which do take place in Tevinter. So I'm wondering if we might might see Fenris again. Probably. It seems reasonable, right? It seems like he'd be the kind of character to return. You've been on the run a long time, then. Three years now. Denarius has a way of finding me. Perhaps it is the markings. Whatever the means, it never takes him long to follow. This is the first time I've given him reason to pause. I suppose there are advantages in numbers. Ellie says, yeah, and I know I want my best friend's dad to officiate, because uh, he was my church's pastor. I was also thinking of having my uh, current pastor say blessing at a reception, because uh, I want them both there. That makes sense. It's, uh, I mean... I don't know. Uh, we went very default, and I actually really, really liked it that way. Uh, that we went to our parish, and our priest, and we just uh, do us the marriage. Uh, and, it, and that was that, right? Uh, it was relatively simple and relatively straightforward, and it was absolutely beautiful. I have nothing to complain about. Uh, Kevin says, yeah, just get it over with and uh, fire up the baby factory. Romance. Well, I mean, yes, Charlie, perhaps. Because you're not married yet, so... Um, but also, I mean, we do have two kids. We've been married for not quite five years, so. But yeah, kind of. Kind of. Haven't you sought help before? Hirelings, when I could steal the coin. Never anyone of substance. Until you. Denarius will not give up, however. I await his return. What if he does give up? What then? Then I go to him. I will not live with a wolf at my back. You won't let sleeping dogs lie? No. I am no fool. I mean, we... Um, I thought he was going to continue the back-and-forth metaphors, but... Eventually we'll have 12, no big deal. Something like that. If you're looking to start a life, you could stay. We shall see. I should thank you again for helping me against the Hunters. Had I known Anso would find me a man so capable, I might have asked him to look sooner. It turned out well enough. It did at that. I will not keep you longer. Another time, perhaps. Fenris's entire personality is that he's edgy and got out of a bad breakup. But I wouldn't call... Being chased by his former slave master, a bad breakup. But, I mean, I guess it... I guess it fits the archetype. I, I suppose, personality-wise. I don't know. That seems like a horrible way of putting that. Uh, so we should talk to Anders, but let's go to the house first. What am I, your servant? There's a letter for you on the desk. Uh, private investigator says the thing is we uh, we didn't have the whole after party at the wedding. We just went home and watched a movie. That's nice. That's nice. We did again. Uh, families insisted, so we uh, they rented a um, a little pavilion at a park right nearby, right near the right near the church. And it was nice. It was a really nice time. Uh, Kyla says if I have kids, I want to uh, I want to cap it off at four because uh, I would go crazy with more than that. Well, maybe. Um, 
Erica says, I'm already 30. Um, how much longer will I have a full egg garden? You're not 30 yet. I'm 30. Relax. You'll be 30 later this year. Letter for Carver. Dear Carver, thank you for your letter. It's so nice to hear uh, that you're still alive. I'm sorry about Bethany. How is your brother taking it? I hope he's all right. Please give him a hug for me and a kiss. Did we find a girl in Kirkwall? Please say he didn't. I think that would break my heart. I always thought he liked me, but I didn't know why nothing ever came of it. He looked at me once, that one time at the fair, and I thought I was going to die from happiness. I don't know why you never brought, up, brought us together. You're a bad friend, Carver. You're coming back to Ferelden, aren't you? I miss all of you. I think I've filled out just a little more since you left. I think your brother would appreciate it. I'm... I look so much better in dresses now, and even more amazing out of them. I'm living with my aunt in Denerim since Lothering is gone. Write me soon. Your friend, Peaches. That's awkward. Uh, Kevin says he knows new moms into their mid-40s, so it could be a long time. That's true. That is true. Um, same crew. Go and see Anders. Kid every two or three years? Yeah, maybe. Um, I was says know a woman who had kids in her 50s. Also, yeah, definitely a possibility. Uh, Dark Town. And from my understanding, you can have kids for longer if you keep having kids. God willing for both of those things as well. Uh, is this the way? No. What is it? Anders place all over there. All the way over there. Have you ever been to a reenactment? I, I have. I forget when and what exactly. I know it's Civil War. There's some Civil War reenactments up here quite a bit. Uh, around here. Um, it was a while ago. A good long time ago. High school, I think? I think it was high school. I was some manner of older kid. Uh, I've never been in one, though. Um, far too expensive a hobby, I think. I had a friend like you once. Got in all kinds of trouble. Dragged me along. Didn't think I'd be doing that again. I got a bit weighty the last time we talked. Sorry for putting that on you. Now this is, yes, all the babies. With all the adorableness and cuteness, that's for sure. I hear Michael howling like a wolf in the other room. Again. So yeah, there's that too. Uh, Kevin says, my best friend and his wife uh, have averaged one every year and a half. They're at five. Wow, congratulations. Man. You can tell me anything. Anything? Be careful what you offer. Don't make it weird. I just... I hope I didn't seem too selfish when I told you about justice. Oh, no. I didn't know what would That's happen. not. I figured a willing host, a friend. It had to be better than playing the demon and haunting some corpse. Let's not. Spirits aren't meant to inhabit human bodies. That's what demons do. The Templars have everything. For a thousand years, they've had the Knights, the Lyrium, the Bloody Maker on their side. You're lucky they never found you. Most of us, they hunt us down before we've even learned our letters. They tell your parents they'll be thrown in prison if they ever ask about you, stripped of their rights in the eyes of the Maker. And if you run away, they hunt you down. Again, and again, and again. You're speaking from personal experience. Andraste's words were that magic must not rule over man. It is not ruling to simply wish for the same rights as any man. It's Doesn't not wrong. every mage deserve the freedom you've had? That is true. That is, he has a very solid point there. Um, but, again, this is a game all about well-intentioned extremists. That's kind of the core of the story. Private Investigator says, honestly, deep down, I don't want kids. I just don't like kids. I mean, I... 
I've never been... I've never been, like... Really, really friendly or good around kids. Um... But with my own kids, it's very different. Um, and then I even even then, I think, you know, having kids of my own has made me better around other kids as well too. Uh, it really is just a thing to a thing to acclimate to, just like anything else. Uh, at least in my experience. Um, yeah, Eric is absolutely right about this. Uh, let's go with the blooming rose, and that's that should be about all we have time for. Um, yeah, if we hit five in this house, we are going to have to get another one. Maybe sell this one uh, as well, but we'll at least have to get a new one. Uh, house, I mean. Um, maybe just buy that house next door that keeps getting sold. It's not the worst idea. Um, there has in indeed been enough bonking, and we're about to go into uh, The Blooming Rose. Um, scramble everyone eggs, everybody's eggs. Jesus, Kevin. Um, all right, private investigator says, "All right, I'm gonna head to bed. Uh, good rest of your night, to everyone. Good night. Um, we will see you next time. How about we start here next time? Because it is just about midnight, and then I think that is a good time to call it and a good place to call it. We've got some investigation to do in the whorehouse, so I guess we'll start next time with that. So." Thank you all for joining me. Uh, have a good night, Private Investigator. Have a good night, everybody else. Uh, and I will see everybody next time. Don't forget, we are starting Far Cry 5 on Monday. Uh, and then we're going to be continuing right here, uh, picking up right where we left off with Dragon Age 2 on Thursday. Uh, yeah, two mortgages. Yeah. Ooh, sweet streaming money. That's probably not going to happen. Anyway... Thank you all. Like I said, thank you all for joining me. Uh, thanks for joining tonight, and I hope to see you on Monday, and I hope to see you again next Thursday. Good night, everyone.